Howdy folks, welcome to version 2 of the A plus practice questions. As you can see on the screen, these practice questions are specifically for the CompTIA A plus 220-1101 exam. For those of you who are new to my channel and who are wondering if these questions would help you with studying for the exam, yes, they would. And we will also help you with any other version of this exam. So if you're attempting to write an older version of this A plus exam or most likely a newer version, these questions will help you with that as well. At the end of the day, one plus one will always be two here, folks. The newer exams will still measure you and test you on the same skills and they'll cover the same objectives. In case anyone is wondering if these are the actual questions from the exam, no, they are not. These practice questions of mine do, however, test you on the same things, though. So if you understand them and if you're able to follow along, then you're ready to go and write. If you feel like you don't understand them or if you feel uncomfortable of the topics and the questions, then please do not go and write the exam. Rather go and study some more and then come back here later on. And if you feel more comfortable with the topics, then maybe then you can go and consider to go and write the exam. Alrighty, like usual, now that we have all the blah blah out of the way, if you folks haven't done it already, please do your homie here a favor and like this video. It helps me and helps the channel out a lot when you do that. And if you'd like to know when I release more practice questions or other training videos, then maybe also consider subscribing. Otherwise you might miss it. All right, let's start with question one. Vertical streaks are appearing on the output of a laser printer. Which of the following items is the most likely cause? All right, so the very first thing I want to bring to your attention here, guys, is whenever you see a word, like in this case, the word most in capital letters, that normally means there's more than one answer in the exam that may or may not be correct here. And they want you to pay attention. So you'll see very often in the actual A plus exam, they're going to use the word most, they'll use the word best or most likely. And these words will be in caps, and that means pay attention. There may or may not be more than one answer here, and they want to know which one is the most correct out of these answers. All right. So vertical streaks, first of all, that's the issue here. So that's when the printer prints. On the actual paper that comes out of the printer, there's a couple of lines, most likely some black lines or white lines. 10 to 1, it's a couple of black lines. All right, so this is normally because the printer is not cleaning itself properly to a certain degree, but we'll get to that in just a second. Now, looking at the possible answers we've got here, there's four possible answers. And this is normally what's going to happen in the exam as well. For the most part, they'll give you four possible answers, of which you can only choose one. And um, now and then, you, you might get some other types of questions where they'll ask you to go and drag and drop, maybe choose all that apply. Um, but for the most part, about 90% of your exam is going to consist of four possible answers of which you can only choose one. Now the answers I've got on the screen for you guys there, the first one is roller. Um, right off the bat, I'm going to tell you guys the answer is not the roller. There's a bit of a picture for you guys of what a roller might look like. So the rollers, guys, is the little rubber wheels you would find in most printers. And uh, their purpose is basically just to move papers along. It picks up the paper in the tray, you know, wherever you put your paper, it moves it along and eventually it spits it out. So that's, that's basically all it does. But just like the rubber wheels on your car, rubber tires, over time, if you use them enough, they get smooth and you start losing traction. Now these little rubber wheels in printers, the same thing happens to them, believe it or not. As time goes by, the more you use them, they start losing traction and paper's going to start slipping on the one side or both sides. And this is the most common cause for things like paper jams. So if there was a paper jam issue, especially if it was happening quite often, yes, the answer would most likely be roller. But the issue here is not a paper jam. It's streaks on the paper. So it's most likely some residue, ink, and whatever. So yeah, we can rule out rollers. It's not rollers. Here's another picture for you guys of what a roller might look like, just in case you're curious. Looking at answer B there. I'm right off the bat going to rule that one out as well. So ribbon, guys, is a special kind of ink we use in impact printers. We also call these dot matrix printers. It's a very old kind of printer. We don't really find them anymore. You still find them. 
but they're quite rare and if you do find one it's it's a mission of note to try and find spare parts for these printers because of how old they are i suppose you could call them legacy printers so where laser printers would use toner ink which is like a powder kind of ink and inkjet printers would go and use a liquid kind of ink you'd find that impact printers or dot matrix printers they use a special kind of ribbon it looks like a piece of paper, like a bluish, purplish, blackish kind of looking paper. Very much the same as what you might find in some invoice books. As invoice books, Ooh, can't pronounce that. You'll find these in some countries. If you write on the one side of the paper, it'll actually go and copycat itself onto the other piece of paper. Very faint ink. So it's, it's, very, it's very similar to that. It's kind of like a carbon kind of paper, I believe is what they call it. So it's a special kind of paper, a special kind of ink they use with impact printers. So it's got nothing to do with that. Uh, there's a little bit of a picture for you guys of what a ribbon might look like. Now the third answer they've got here is drum. Uh, now there's a bit of a picture for you guys of what a drum might look like. Uh, these drums are actually very expensive. You do find them in laser printers. There's another picture for you guys of a, of a drum. I'm trying to show you guys as many pictures as possible so you can get the sense of what the heck we're talking about here. Now that actually is the answer as I've said. So I'm going to highlight this in green for you guys. That drum as time goes by it's it's supposed to clean itself properly but as time goes by it stops doing that i mean given enough time anything will fail and this thing does not clean itself properly so there's some residue ink and what have you left on this drum and that's potentially what you're going to start seeing so sometimes the symptoms would be vertical streaks this could be black streaks white streaks you'll see some smudges to a certain degree you might even see what we call shadow images some people call them ghost images or echo images that is when you print the page and you kind of sort of still see part of the previous image that you printed. Every page you print, you can kind of still see like a faint image of the previous document you printed. So this thing is no longer cleaning itself. It's got a self-cleaning mechanism that's supposed to kick in after every page. Happens in a fraction of a second. And as time goes by, it doesn't clean itself properly. So you're going to have to go and replace the drum. It can happen. It can be done. And it is bloody expensive. Let me tell you that much. Um, the fourth answer here, we obviously know that's not the answer since I've told you the answer is D. The transfer belt. There's a bit of a picture of what it might look like. Transfer belt, well, its purpose is to, well, transfer things around. It's supposed to move things around. And in case you're not quite sure yet what it looks like, uh, here's another picture for you guys. And um, I think everything you need to know is kind of in the name there, isn't it? All right, folks, let's move on to question two. And before I can even read it, I think you guys are probably going to know the answer to this one because of what I said in the first one. And that's fine, because the whole purpose of this video is for you guys to learn and to be able to pass the exam, which is why I'm explaining these things to you guys. And you'd find in the previous question, I explained a couple of extra things to you guys. Now, reading this question, it says, you have a user that complains about the printouts from their laser printer. So once again, we've got a laser printer. Once again, there's some sort of problem with the printouts. This time it might be something different. Now they mention the printouts appear to have a double image. It's also known as an echo image, a ghost image, a shadow image. It's got many names and based on what I've said in the previous question, you most likely know what the answer here is. So which printer consumable or part is causing this? All right, so in the previous question, I told you guys there's a certain component we have in the printer and after every page it's supposed to clean itself failing to do so you'll start seeing things like streaks white or black streaks some small little speckles smudges you might even see well a double image what was that component it was the drum guys so i'm going to highlight that for you guys here and um, obviously there's a picture and all that on the screen here uh, so it's not a, an ink cartridge is not going to cause that. An ink cartridge, if there's some sort of issue wrong of the ink cartridge, you're just going to see huge smudges. So it could be lots of smudges. That's assuming it's an ink cartridge. So if it's an inkjet printer and you see smudges, it's most likely the ink cartridge because these don't actually have a drum. If it's a laser printer and you see smudges, then it's most likely the drum that's the issue here. So it depends on what kind of printer it is we're dealing with. The question specifically says it's a laser printer. So we can, we can completely rule out the ink cartridge. It's not going to be an ink cartridge issue. It's not going to be a roller issue because if it was a roller issue, you'd have slippage and you're going to have paper jams. Rollers, their job is literally just to move papers wrong. Once again, 
The drum doesn't clean itself properly, like I said, so that's the answer here. And the fuser, for those of you who don't know, because that is a new answer compared to question one, its job is to heat up the powder ink, which is called toner. It's supposed to heat it up and fuse it to the paper. So believe it or not, the, the ink powder actually gets charged magnetically and the drum gets charged magnetically. And um, when the paper basically attracts the ink, the fuser basically just goes and, well, heats it up and burns it to the paper. That's its job. So you'll find if you print a lot of pages in a laser printer and you immediately go touch the papers afterwards, you'll feel it's actually still kind of crispy and warm in most cases. All right, folks, let's move on to question three. You have a user that contacts your help desk regarding a possible failing thumbprint scanner. Which of the following troubleshooting steps should be performed first? And you see what I meant there by the word first being in capital letters. I told you guys that in the beginning of question one. Whenever you see something in capital letters, that means you need to pay special attention to that. That's very, very important. All right, so we know there's a user. We know there's a thumbprint scan that they've got, and it's no longer working. So it sounds like it used to work. It has stopped working. What troubleshooting steps should you perform first? So there's more than one step that can most likely be done here, but we want to know, or at least they want to know in this instance, what should you do first? Looking at the answer A, it says, ask about possible changes. So far, that doesn't sound like a bad idea because it's not going to cost you any money. And normally if something did work and it just randomly stops working, then, well, one of the best ways to figure out what the cheese is going on here is just to, well, ask the user some questions. Uh, ask them, like, when last has this device worked? When did it start doing this? Have you changed anything hardware-wise, software-wise? Have you installed, uninstalled things? You know, that kinds of stuff. Looking at answer B, it says, attempt to clean the scanner. Although not a bad answer, I would not say that should be my first answer. That's going to refer back to that capital letters in first. So the first says, what should you do first? Now, attempting to clean the scanner, that would probably be my second step that I would go and do. I haven't looked at the other answers yet. Uh, a, that would be my first choice. B would be my second choice. Looking at answer C, it says requisition a new scanner. Not necessarily wrong, but that's a little extreme, and that will probably be my third choice. I'm not just saying that because it's called answer C here. It just coincidentally is in that order, the answers. So if I had to choose an answer out of those A, B, and C, A would literally have been my first choice. It's the quickest and the easiest way to get to the problem. Uh, path of least resistance, as they say. B would be my second choice, and C would be my third choice. All three would probably get you to a working product at the end of the day, but yeah, C, a little extreme. Looking at answer D, file a damage report. Also a little excessive. So none of these answers are really wrong. Um, so we really need to pay attention to what it says first here. And my answer, guys, I'm going to stick with answer A here. Just ask about possible changes. For all we know, this user plugged it out and then they plugged it back in and it started with start its nonsense. Maybe they recently cleaned it. Maybe they recently moved it. It can be any amount of things. So ask about any possible changes and more than likely it's going to lead you to your answer. Moving on to question four. Which of the following uses port 20 and 21 to transfer data in clear text? Is it SMTP? That's sending email. So for those of you that don't know, SMTP uses port 25. Is it B, Telnet? No, that uses port 23. That's to remote connect to something. Normally, we use that to remote connect to something like a, a network device. This could be a router. It can be a switch. It isn't clear text, though, and we don't really use it as much as we used to because it can be hacked and compromised very easily. Its replacement, ironically, is um, SSH, which is the next possible answer there. So it's not going to be SSH. SSH, uh, it uses port 22 where Telnet uses port 23. SSH does the exact same thing for the most part, except it is an encrypted. Telnet is clear text, SSH is encrypted. You go and use it to go and connect to devices like a, a router or a switch, and you can go and configure it via a command line interface. And uh, most of the time we use something like PuTTY. Looking at answer D there, that is FTP, file transfer protocol, and it uses port 20 and 21. So that is your answer here. Now, we already know the answer here is D, guys, but before we move on to question five here, 
you would be wise to familiarize yourself with what they call well-known port numbers. It's also called common port numbers. So if you go look at the amount of port numbers that is available in the, in the IT industry, there's about 65,500 and something port numbers. I think it's 536, if I'm not mistaken. 36 or 53, I, I can't remember. I'm striking a blank here. Um, anyway, you'll be wise to, to know some of the most common port numbers. Though. So you don't need to know all 65,000 odd port numbers. Absolutely not. Luckily not. That would be crazy. Um, you can look at the well-known port numbers. It's approximately somewhere between 10 and 30 port numbers. Um, the people that established these port numbers, ugh, they probably did that in the 80s or the 90s. So they went and looked at what is widely used and most commonly used at the time. And those port numbers are the only ones that's actually open by default. Majority of your port numbers are actually closed by default for your own safety and for your user safety. And only the stuff the average user would use every day, like web browsing, email, that kind of stuff, those port numbers would be open by default. So it's only about 20 or 30 maybe of them. So you would be wise to familiarize yourself with those port numbers because they like asking about those in these exams. If anyone plans on taking CompTIA a little bit further, if you plan on going to N plus and writing that exam, you absolutely need to know the most common port numbers. You need to know what those numbers are. You need to know what they're used for. I guarantee you they will ask you that in the N plus exam as well, even more than the A plus exam. All right, let's move on to question five. Multiple users who share the same printer in an office have reported that they see thin lines, vertical lines that cover the entire height of every page printed from the printer. All right. Which of the following steps should you perform most likely to resolve this issue? See, there again we go with a big word being in capital letters. So there's more than one answer here that might be right, guys. So I, I think I can already guess what the answer is going to be without even looking at it because you can see they talk about a printout again. So that's the third question we've had so far. That's about something being printed and this thing has now got some lines or something on it. Although in this question, it doesn't specify whether it is a laser printer or not. In the previous two questions, we knew it was a laser printer. So we're going to have to look at the possible answers and, well, make a gander. So answer A here says reinstall the printer driver on each computer. It could be, but it's a little excessive. I would I would leave that as one of my secondary answers. I would not do that first because that takes longer. It's a little extreme. Looking at answer B, replace the printer paper with a new ream. Uh, no. So generally, if you're going to go and change the paper, you're probably going to see the same lines there, guys. It's just keep making these lines on multiple papers. So just changing the ream, that's not going to make any difference. Answer C, clear the print spooler on each queue. Absolutely not. So, so far, I'm still sticking of answer A. The print spooler is basically the queue for your print documents. If you are printing to a printer and you're the only one printing to it, your print document is going to come out immediately, instantly. If you have a printer directly connected to your laptop or desktop, the print spooler is on that desktop or laptop. When you click on print, the document goes into the queue, which they call a print spooler, and it basically instantly prints your document. So any time it really kicks in the print spooler to the point where you can actually see documents in it is if you are printing to a printer where other people are also printing to it at the same time. So that will be one of those big printers you'll see in the corner of the office and you have to walk up to it and you have to wait for your print job and most likely other people are also printing. In that situation, if you were to go check the print spooler now, you would see various documents from various people. You can see how big these documents are in megabits. You can go and see um, how many pages it is, who sent the document, all that kinds of stuff. And no, you cannot go and ch cancel other people's print jobs unless you are the administrator. And looking at answer D here, perform the drum cleaning procedure. Ah, okay, so far I'm going to go with that now. So instead of A, I'm going to change my answer to D here because that looks like a, a path of least resistance. So A says reinstall the print driver on each computer. It might solve the problem. If there, if there was no drum cleaning here, I would definitely have chosen that one. But uh, I mean, earlier we said in question one as well, whenever you see lines, smudges and stuff, it's most likely a drum issue. The drum is most likely not cleaning itself. Um, so answer D says, perform a drum cleaning procedure and that might solve your problem. Although in real life, guys, I don't think that's going to permanently solve your problem. Most likely this drum is no longer working properly. And the real, real correct answer, in my opinion, here would be to go and replace the drum. Very expensive exercise, but I'll probably be the correct answer here, although it's not in the list. 
Looking at question six, you have been tasked to set up a device with two factor authentication. Which of the following meets this requirement? Now, before we look at the answers, I mean, there they are for you guys. Two factor means you need to prove you are who you claim to be, but you need to do this in two different ways and it has to fall into two different categories. There's many different categories you get, but there's three main ones we always talk about. The first one is something you know. That's the first category. That would be something like a PIN or a password. The second category would be something that you have, something that you've got physically on your person. This can be something like a bank card, a smart card, a thumb, an OTP that's already being received on your cell phone. Maybe this is some sort of app acknowledgement you've got to do on your cell phone. So a cell phone would basically be a form of something you've got. The third category would be something that you are, which is normally biometric. This could be a fingerprint, eye scan, facial recognition, voice recognition, all that kinds of stuff. So if I ask you, now keeping what I just said in mind, if I ask you for a password and a PIN, like answer B there, a password falls into the first category, which is something you know. Now looking at the, the other one there in answer B, it says a PIN, which is also something you know. So a password is something you know, a PIN is something you know, so they both fall into the same category. So it's not two-factor or multi-factor authentication. It needs to fall into two different categories or more. Now, if you look at answer A, it says a password and a password. No, that's just literally the same thing. If you look at answer C, a password and a thumbprint. Now, that's pretty plausible. So a password, it is something I know. A thumbprint is something that I am. So that will be biometric. So that's a different category. So, so far, C is in fact correct. I think that is the answer here. Looking at answer D, it says a thumbprint, which is something I am. And it says a retinal scan, which is also something I am. So D has got two things, but they're in the same category. So the only answer here, which has got two different categories, folks, is answer C. So that's the three categories, something you know, something you have, something you are. Now, in case you're curious, yes, you do get other categories out there. You get, for example, where you, where you are. You get something that you are doing and, and, and there's many categories. But the three I've mentioned is the three main ones, the most common ones and the only ones they will test you on in this specific exam. All right. Question seven. Which of the following best describes the main purpose of a web server. So what is a web server, guys? A web server is something that hosts a website. It might be for you. It could be your website, your personal website, your company website. It could potentially be for a client of yours. Who knows? So that is generally what a web server does. You can get these in lots of places, guys. A web server could be on premises in your building. You might have built this server. It could be a physical server or a virtual server. And you have installed all kinds of softwares and stuff on that server to be able to host, well, websites. You could potentially go and rent these servers from various companies across the globe. And they will host your server for you, your, your website for you. You pay them an X amount of, of money every month for the service. And um, depending on who you're hosting with and what kind of software they've got, you can normally log on to your, your website from the back end and you can go and control it. Alternatively, there's many, many other parties you can go make use of. I mean, heck, you can even go and make use of Microsoft Azure if you want to, and they can go and host it for you. To a certain degree, you are going to relinquish some level of control, but you also have a lot of control. Now, after what I've just said, let's look at the possible answers. Answer A says, hosting home pages and business portals. Oopsie daisy, I think I might have given you guys the answer because of what I just explained. Now, looking at answer B, Storing files and controlling user accounts. Now, that doesn't sound at all like what I just explained now, does it? Answer C says providing IP addresses and printing servers. So, no. Providing IP addresses, that's normally the job of a DHCP server. Printing services, that's normally the job of a print server. Answer D is setting up personal mailboxes and calendars. That's normally the job of an exchange server. It could be on-premises. It could be in the cloud. Either way, potato, potato, it's the job of an exchange server. So if you look at answer B again, storing files and controlling user access, storing files is the job of file server, which we normally call a DFS, domain file server. And controlling user access is normally the job of an active directory. 
So that would be a server where you've installed ADDS. So the answer here, guys, is A, hosting home pages and business portals. Question eight, you have a user who brings you an old looking laptop. If they report issues with their keyboard, you inspect the laptop and you don't see any external damage, but you do, however, notice that many keystrokes don't register in a word processor. So basically when you go and you open Notepad or Office Word or anything like that, and you start typing some of these keys, some of them register and some of them don't. So the laptop works fine though, if you use an external keyboard. So which of the following would most likely resolve this issue? So once again, if you take this laptop and you open something like Notepad or Word, any place where you can basically go and type random letters, and you go and type random letters on the laptop's keyboard, some of them register, some of them don't. But as soon as you go plug in an external keyboard, like a desktop keyboard into this laptop, a USB, uh, cable, you plug it into the USB port, this is a normal desktop keyboard into that laptop, you press some keys, and now suddenly it works. So we can clearly say it's not a laptop issue, it's a keyboard issue. There's something wrong with the laptop's keys. Now the most common issue of laptop keys in that regard is because they're dirty. It could be because someone spilled something on a laptop and you're lucky enough for the laptop to still work, uh, but more often than not it's because there's something underneath the keys. They've gotten sticky, there's maybe some crumbs under them because some people love eating over their keyboards, especially in an office environment. They're very guilty of that. So let me get the answers here, folks. A says, disable the sticky keys feature. If it was a sticky keys feature issue, you would experience the same issue with the desktop um, keyboard. It's not a sticky keys issue. Looking at answer B, clean the keyboard. Well, you know what? I think that's the answer here. Looking at answer C, charge the laptop. If it was a laptop charging issue, guys, once again, you would have the same issue with the desktop keyboard. The desktop keyboard would not have made a difference then, now would it? Looking at answer D, reset the BIOS settings to default. Uh-uh, same solution here. If it was a BIOS issue, guys, but uh, the external keyboard would not work. It's not a BIOS issue. It's not a charging issue. It's not a sticky issue. It's simply a matter of the keys are, are, are dirty. So when I say sticky keys, that does not mean the keys are actually sticky, as in you can feel them sticky. It's an actual function you get on your laptop or desktop. Um, so when I say sticky keys, I mean the keys are literally sticky. Someone spilled something on them or underneath them. So the answer here, guys, is clean the freaking keyboard. All right, moving to question nine. Which of the following standards supports MIMO technology? All right, so we've got four standards here, wireless standards to be more precise. So what they mean by MIMO, for those of you not familiar with the term, that means it's, can, it's, it's got the ability to transfer over more than one channel. Now, only one out of the four here can actually do that. The other three can only transfer over one channel. All right, so if you look at 802.11a, that is one channel. 802.11b is one channel, 802.11g is one channel, and A and G is for the most part pretty much the same freaking thing, it's just different frequencies there. B is more things like Bluetooth and that kinds of jazz. N is long range high speed communication that needs the line of sight. If you look at A, B, and G, those are short range and they can basically work through walls and objects and stuff. N long range, high speed communication that needs a line of sight. So that's what you would use ultimately to go and connect different buildings to one another of an organization. It's not the only frequency, I mean, you get other ones like AC and AX and that kinds of stuff. But N is probably one of the most common ones. It has the ability to work with more than one channel, up to four the last time I checked, it could possibly be more than that now. The more channels it has, the more speed your N will have. So if you, look at, if you look at like A, B, and G, they've got for the most part kind of sort of fixed speeds. In yes and no, it's going to depend on the amount of channels you've got. Now in case you haven't figured it out, N is the answer here, guys. So let me just highlight that in green for you guys. Um, it has the ability to go up to four channels. Normally, the more channels you've got, the more it's going to cost you. So if it has one, you know, you can think of this as lanes on, on a freeway or a highway. If it has one, communication will take, you know, take place. If you've got two lanes on the highway, well, then there's more cars that can travel on that per minute. 
three lanes equals more cars and four lanes even more cars. So the more lanes you've got, the more cars you can handle per minute. The same can be said about channels with these wireless standards. The more channels you've got, the faster you can transfer a data at the end of the day. Moving on to question 10. One of your clients is an online retailer. So it's an online store. I mean, so many stores these days are online. They want to save some money and are considering migrating to the public cloud. So you get different kinds of cloud. Public cloud is when you put everything online on someone else's property. So you get private cloud, you get hybrid cloud. Public cloud is when it's true blue, everything is online and it's on someone else's property. Anyway, so they say they want to save some money and are considering migrating to the public cloud so that they can easily and quickly add capacity when it's peak shopping season and then reduce it again quickly and easily when it's off peak season. So what they mean by adding capacity, in case you're not sure, that means if I have a server online now or a website online or whatever it is online, if I need more resources, more RAM, more storage space, more speed, I can nearly instantly add more. And if I no longer need it, you can reduce it. Why would one want to go and reduce it? Because in the cloud, you only pay for what you use. That's not just Microsoft. It applies to Amazon, which is their AWS platform. All of these cloud, pl cloud platforms work like that. So if you don't use something, you don't pay for it. So the more resources you add to a server or the more servers you add, the more you pay. The less you have, the less you pay. So if it's peak season, they might need to go and add more RAM or more space or more whatever, depending on what the situation is. It's just to be able to handle more traffic on their website. So they want to be able to add more capacity. And then eventually when, you know, the hype season goes a little bit down and things are settling down and gets quiet again, then they obviously want to reduce that because what's the point of paying for all that capacity if you're not actually using it or you don't actually need all of it? It's wasteful expenditure. So what platform would allow them to do that. Although I think the question is here more of which feature in the cloud would allow you to go and do that, adding capacity and removing the capacity very quickly and very easily. So the question here, the last part of the question says, which of the following best describes this aspect of cloud computing? Now, all four of those things listed there, guys, all four of them are indeed aspects of cloud computing. That much I can confirm. Looking at A, high availability, that's not the answer. High availability is, well, you'll find most of these cloud platforms that give you a 99.9% .9 uptime guarantee, possibly even more if you're willing to throw more money at it. That means your stuff will never be offline for the most part. If you go work it out on a calculator, I think it's only about four to eight hours downtime per year, maybe two to four hours. It sounds like a lot, guys, but it's literally, it's minimal. If you go look at your service being down for maintenance, being down to change this and change that and fix this and fix that, at the end of the day, all of that adds up and you're going to add up to days, maybe even weeks possibly. So being down only between two and eight hours a year is amazing. It really, really is. So at the end of the day, the service, whatever service is being rendered here, whether it be a website or a virtual machine server of some kind, it will, for the most part, never be unavailable. So that's not here. We want to add capacity and remove capacity quickly and easily. High availability has got nothing to do with that. Looking at answer B. Rapid elasticity, I'm hoping I'm pronouncing that correctly because I normally struggle to pronounce elasticity. Ugh, gets my tongue in a knot when I say that. That actually is the answer. So that, has, that basically comes down to the ability in the cloud to be able to add more servers or resources or remove servers and resources very quickly. So you, we, we actually call this scaling in most cases. You can scale up or out or back in uh, or back down very quickly, and very easily. Can be done on premises, but on premises it's super slow, super expensive. And if you were to go and expand on premises, you're normally stuck with that stuff because you bought it. In a cloud, you're more renting it. You're not buying it, you're renting it. So that's the answer here. But in case you don't know what C and D is, C, which says metered utilization, comes down to the concept of only paying for what you use. So we accidentally explained that earlier. You only pay for what you use in the cloud. So if you've got a virtual machine in the cloud and you turn that sucker off, guess what? You're not paying for it. D, which is shared resources, is also known as resource pooling. Just FYI, in case you don't know. So when you put something in the cloud, whether it be a website or a server of some kind, it's generally going to be on a data server, a server of some kind, in a data center, and you are sharing that server with other companies in the world. So if I have five virtual machines, they might be on server seven in Microsoft's data center, if this is Microsoft. 
But on that server 7, there is maybe 10 other companies that's also got virtual machines on that exact same server. You are sharing resources with other people on that server. If you're concerned about security or data spillage or anything like that, you don't have to be concerned. We, we, we are talking about companies like Amazon and Microsoft here and those. They've got such a huge IT budget. They've got the best of the best and the most, you know, the latest of the latest and stuff. And the security there is top notch. But if you really are paranoid like my wife, and if you're willing to throw enough money at it, you can go and get yourself your own dedicated server. Then it would not be shared resources or resource pooling, as they say. Moving on to question 11. Which of the following describes metered utilization of cloud resources? Oopsie daisy, I think I just accidentally gave you the answers to that one. And that's fine, because at the end of the day, the purpose of this video is to explain this stuff to you guys and to make sure you understand this stuff so that you can go and write the exam. So no matter how they throw these questions at you in the exam, if, as long as you understand the actual topics themselves, it doesn't matter how they throw these questions at you because you'll get them right. That's the goal of this video, is to actually explain the topics to you guys so that it doesn't matter how they throw the questions at you. So we know what meter utilization is because of what I said in question 10. Meter utilization is when you only pay for what you use. Now looking at the four available answers here, you can probably guess which one it is. So looking at the first one, resources provisioned instantly. Uh, no, that is rapid elasticity, which was also an answer. You see here now it's being called something else. Resources being provisioned instantly is called rapid elasticity. God, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, but yes, that's what it is. Answer B here says payments or yeah, payments made only for resources that are used. <laughs> what do you guys think? Yes, that's the answer here. Looking at answer C, resources pooled to increase computing power. Uh, that is shared resources. So once again, it's the same answers, but I have on purposely called them something else now, just to see if you're paying attention. D, implementation of rapid elasticity. It's, <laughs> it's very much the same as answer A, isn't it? All right, a user complains about an issue with a new printer that is no longer accepting print jobs. You verify that the printer is indeed on, and you also notice that on the LCD screen, it's got the following error message. Now, if you look at the little section that, that I typed for you guys in pink, it says paper jam. And if you're really lucky, it might even tell you where it is, which is the case here. It says paper jam in fuser. Which of the following is the most efficient next step you can go and take? And if we look at the four available answers we've got here, the first one says, check the printer path to locate any obstructions. So depending on the printer, this actually applies to most printers, you can actually go and check where the paper goes in to the paper and um, kind of sort of follow the path that it's going to take and then eventually where it comes out. You might be able to see some sort of obstruction, you know, something that's blocking the paper's path. Now it's very, very unlikely that some random debris is going to be in there blocking the paper's path unless you had a previous paper jam. But if you had a previous paper jam, it would normally have told you paper jam. It's a paper jam. And you would have removed it and resolved it back in. It would have refused to print, quite frankly. So the answer here, guys, is not A. B says, turn the printer on and off to see if the error clears. So depending on what exactly the error is, it might resolve the issue. But in most cases, from my experience, it will not. Especially if it says anything along the lines of paper jam. A paper jam is not just a digital error. It is something physically that has happened with the printer. And you guys can obviously guess what it's about. It's about an actual piece of paper, a whole paper, most likely an A4 size paper, that's gotten jammed somewhere along the line. So turning the, paper, the, the printer on and off again is not going to clear the error, guys. C says replace the fuser. Now the fuser is what actually fuses the ink to the paper. Laser printers, I mean, they, they talk about a fuser here, so this is probably a laser printer. Laser printers use toner. It's a powder kind of ink. And it uses heat to apply this toner slash powder kind of ink to the paper, which is why you'll feel the page is always warm when it prints afterwards. Then the fuser is just to fuse it. The fuser doesn't actually move the paper along per se and all that. So it's not going to cause a jam. If there's something wrong with the fuser, what you will experience is the fuser might not clean itself properly or it might not fuse something properly. So you're going to see some residue ink that's just lying all over the place, some powder ink. Then you know, okay, the fuser is not fusing properly anymore. 
or you'll start seeing some streaks, some black streaks, or you know, black line streaks, some white line streaks, some little dots or smudges. That's also an indication the fuse is no longer working properly, or that it's not fusing properly, or that it's not cleaning itself properly. So it's not A, it's not B, it's not C. So the answer here is D. D says apply a maintenance kit to the printer. Now, yes, that is the answer, but what's included in the maintenance kit, guys, is a whole bunch of things including rollers, new rubber wheels, which we call rollers. This is what actually moves the paper from point A to point B inside the printer. It gets it to its final destination. And usually as time goes by, these rollers get smoother and smoother, just like the tires in your car. The tires in your car are made out of rubber. As time goes by, they get smoother and smoother. And you eventually have to go and replace them with newer ones that's got new thread. Otherwise, you're going to start slipping and it's not going to end well. Now, the rollers in the printer, guys, same story. They start getting smoother and smoother as time goes by with wear and tear. Wear and tear. <laughs> wear and tear. And then you obviously have to go and replace them. Otherwise, they're going to start slipping. And when they start slipping, not if, but when it is going to happen, you're going to start experiencing paper jams. Hence the error we've gotten here. So your answer here, guys, is D. All right, folks, let's move on to question 13. Let's give you guys something else for a bit. You have a user that complains that their desktop computer does not start at all. It's completely and totally and utterly dead. What is the first hardware component you should check or test? So what is the first thing we want to go and check and test? And this is only hardware. We're not talking about software here, boys and girls. We're talking about hardware. What is the first thing we should go and check if a computer does not want to start? So generally a rule of thumb to live by when it comes to computers, guys, is take the path of least resistance. So it's not going to be the RAM. If there was a RAM issue, let's say the RAM is completely kaput. If the RAM was broken, the computer would in fact still start and you would get a beeping code, which we call a BIOS beeping code. It might be one long beep. It might be a lot of rapid beeps. Either way, you would get a beeping code because the RAM is no longer working. If it was the CPU, the computer would also still start, and once again, you would get a BIOS beeping code. Now, answer C or D is the two plausible answers here. They're both actually correct. The one that's more correct here, yeah? remember the, the question says, what should you check first? First in capital letters. That would be the power supply, which is the path of least resistance, and it's the quickest and the easiest thing to go and replace. So you're first going to go and check the PSU, which is power supply unit. That's the little silver box. Um, which provides power to the motherboard. It's got all the little wires and stuff. So you're going to go and check that power supply. If you have a proper power supply tester, feel free to go and use that. But most of the time, you're not going to have that. So what I suggest you do is you take another power supply, a second one, a brand new one, or one from a computer that you know for a fact is working. You plug that sucker in there. You don't have to even remove the old power supply. You literally just put the new one uh, or the other one on top of the box, plug it into the motherboard, Plug a cable in and see if the PC starts. If it does, which 9 out of 10 times it will, then you know, ta-da, it's the power supply. Power supply, very quick and easy to go and change. If it still does not start, then the chances is it's the motherboard or the motherboard and the power supply. But 9 out of 10 times, guys, I can tell you, it's probably the power supply because normally this happens because of a power surge that happened or something along those lines. It's probably going to be the power supply. And never mind it being the more likely culprit here, just quite frankly, is the first thing and the easiest, the cheapest thing to go and change. So if it still doesn't start, you check the motherboard, but to be able to do that, you're unfortunately going to have to change the whole freaking motherboard, which means you also need to change the whole CPU and the RAM and all that most likely. It's a very expensive exercise. It's a lot of work. So I would suggest you start at the power supply first. It's quick, it's easy, it's cheap. Moving on to question 14. One of your users report that occasionally their PC would fail to boot. So it's not always, just sometimes. The user also reports that the performance of their PC is degrading. So for some odd reason, their PC seems to be getting slower and slower. It's lagging and all that. During investigation, you also notice a repetitive ticking noise coming from the PC. Which of the following should you do first? All right, so answer A here says... Check the CD or the DVD tray. There is a small possibility it might be the ticking, doing the ticking sound, but it's not something you hear very commonly from a CD or DVD tray. And even if it is the CD or the DVD tray, it cannot cause the PC to fail to boot. 
and it can definitely not cause the PC's performance to degrade. It's got no influence on the PC's performance. It's got no influence on the PC's booting. No influence whatsoever. Looking at answer B, try to extract the data. Now, why do you suppose they would say that? It's because the PC is about to fail. And when I say fail, I mean fail to the point where you're going to lose data. Now, I'm going to give you guys the answer here, and then I'm going to cover the other answers here as well. Um, I have to give you the answer for this to make sense. The answer here is it's the hard drive that's about to fail. So normally, if you have a computer that's got an old mechanical hard drive, which most computers have, that's the one that's got um, a hard drive that still moves this, with the spindle and all that. It's not a solid state drive. It's the exact opposite of a solid state drive. These hard drives, they sometimes fail. It's got nothing to do with the age, the size, the make. It's completely random. And when you start hearing a ticking sound from a hard drive, that normally indicates that the hard drive has failed or it's about to fail. Now, it's a 50-50. If you're ticking, it could have already failed. Should you be lucky enough to be the other 50% of the time when it has not failed yet, the chances is very likely that it's about to fail sometime soon. It might be in a matter of hours. It could be in a day or two. It could take weeks or months. I've had hard drives that will last for years after they started ticking. That's just very, very, very dumb luck. Um, but generally, from my experience, I can tell you it's going to fail in about a day or two. So if you start hearing ticking or the client starts hearing ticking, your very first action and your main action here should be to back up the data because you don't know when that hard drive is about to fail. And if and when it fails, at least you would have had time to go and back up the data. So the answer here is B, try to extract the data because the hard drive is about to fail. Looking at answer C here, reseat the RAM modules or RAM chips. No, guys. So yes, RAM can cause a PC to get slow, but it's not going to cause the PC to fail to boot. If it is the RAM that's causing it to fail to boot, it would not start at all, period. Now, if you look at the beginning of the question, it says it occasionally fails to boot. Not all the time, just sometimes. If the RAM was loose, it would not start, period. It either would start permanently or it would not start permanently. It's not a matter of, oh, you know what, sometimes it starts and sometimes, no. RAM would either be completely dead, the RAM is not going to work at all, so the PC would not start at all, or it would be in and the PC is going to start every day. It's one or the other. It's not like an in-between kind of thing here. And the only reason why RAM would make your PC lag is if you don't have enough of it. But this is not something that's going to, you know, start making your PC get slower and slower over time. It's just something you'll notice when you start using a lot of RAM. So the answer is definitely not C here, guys. D says inspect the fan. Now, it is possible for the fan to start causing a ticking sound the only reason why this happens is if sometimes one of your wires gets into the fan so this is not something you'll see on a laptop it's something that normally happens on a desktop pc where the wires a lot more loose and if someone moved this pc recently and the cabling inside is not done very neatly there's a chance that one of the wires could actually start going into the fan and the fan is going to start making a ticking sound it will however not cause the pc to fail to boot and it's not going to start degrading the performance of the pc so we can rule out the fan. It can make a ticking sound, but it's not going to cause the PC to fail to boot. It's not going to cause the PC to start degrading in the performance. So we can definitely rule out D. The only answer here, guys, is B. Extract the data. Moving on to question 15. One of your remote users reports connectivity issues of the local internet provider. So when we say remote user, we mean this customer or this user is working remotely from someplace other than the office. It can be their home, most likely will be from home, or it could be from a coffee shop or quite frankly anywhere, any place but the office. So for the purpose of this question, let's assume they're working from home. After one of your technicians reboot the router or router, however you want to pronounce that, or the modem supplied by their ISP, the issue still persists. Uh -huh. So which of the following would best establish the connection in minimal time? So we need to get this user up and running as quick as possible. That's what this issue is all about. It's not to fix the issue per se, it's just to get them up and running again as quickly as possible. Because for all we know, this person's working on something very important and they cannot afford to wait for us to give them a permanent solution. They just need a temporary solution just to get them back up and running again. Maybe they've got a meeting they've got to attend or anything in that regard. So out of the four possible answers we've got in front of us guys, which one would establish a connection for them the quickest and the easiest. Which one would be the best? If you look at answer A, fiber optic. So for us to go and install a fiber optic connection now, guys, it's going to take some time. You're going to have to go and get a line installed and spliced and all that. That's going to take days, weeks even. So 
I'm not very keen on answer A here. Let's look at, uh, at answer B. Answer B says neighbor's Wi-Fi. So far, that is better than fiber. So if your neighbor is close enough and you're able to pick up their Wi-Fi signal, you can always go and ask them very nicely, sir, ma'am, can I quickly jump on your Wi-Fi? My internet's down. I need to attend a meeting, anything like that. So, so far, B is definitely better than A. Answer C says mobile hotspot. Oh, well, that's even better than your neighbor's Wi-Fi. So if you have a phone or something nearby, you can always make a mobile hotspot on that temporarily and then jump on that temporarily. That will literally take you 60 seconds or less to go and do that. Way quicker than jumping on your neighbor's Wi-Fi. So out of A, B, and C, C is the quickest, B is probably the next best answer, and then A is completely out in my opinion. D says logging the ticket of the ISP. Now, that's not wrong, but nobody knows how long they're going to take. It could take five minutes. It could take the whole freaking day. We don't know how long it would take. We don't know what the issue is. It's an unknown time frame. So it's not A, it's not D, it's going to be between B and C. C is the better one, it's the quicker one. And then uh, if C was not there, I would have gone for answer B. That would probably be the next best answer in my opinion. So the answer here, guys, is C, mobile hotspot. Okay, moving on. Question 16. Which of the following utilizes port 443 and transfers data in encrypted text? All right, so which one of these that I've got on the screen, I'm not just going to make it four because where's the fun in that? Um, you guys will be wise to familiarize yourself with common ports. I believe I did mention that earlier in the video. So please go and familiarize yourself with the common ports, also known as well-known port numbers. So looking at answer A, that is hypertext transfer protocol, that's normal web browsing in clear text, and that uses port 80, so it's not A. B is hypertext transfer protocol secure, so that's encrypted web browsing, and that uses port 443, so that's the answer here, I'm going to highlight it in green. C is DNS, so that's domain name server or service, whichever you want to go for, uses port 53, that's converting IPs to names, names to IPs, and that kind of jazz. D is Telnet, so that's to remote connect to something, normally we use PuTTY, it's normally in command line interface, but it isn't clear text, it uses port 23. And then E is SSH, essentially the same thing as Telnet, it uses port 22, also to remote connect to things like routers and switches and stuff, also in the command line interface for the most part. The difference between Telnet and SSH is Telnet is clear text, SSH is encrypted. And then F is remote desktop protocol, which is also to go and remote connect to something, a machine, but this is normally the GUI interface, and it uses port 3389. So all of the things I've listed there, all six of them, is actually well-known port numbers, just so by the way, it's not all of the well-known port numbers, but it is six of them. So yeah, that's already a starting point for you guys, Now I already know what some of them are. Moving on, question 17. What type of network would a user have made if they connect a smartphone to a laptop? Now, A, LAN, local area network, it is a small network. Some people think it is the smallest network, but it is, in fact, not. The smallest network out of the four I've got listed here for you guys is PAN, PAN, which stands for Personal Area Network. And that actually is the answer here. So when you go and connect your smartphone or your tablet or something to something like your laptop, that is a PAN, a Personal Area Network. You can imagine your desktop or your laptop on your desk and basically anything that's with an arm's reach of, well, on that desk, that forms part of your pan. So if I put something on a desk like a printer and I connect it to my laptop or my desktop via wire or wireless, doesn't matter, it's a pan. If I connect my phone or my tablet to my laptop and it's also on my desk, that forms part of my pan. But as soon as I go and connect one extra PC, just one, and that's now via cable or wireless. That is now a LAN. So a LAN is two or more computers, guys. This could be a hundred computers, could be a thousand computers. But as soon as you've got two or more computers, now you've got a LAN. So first it's PAN, that's the smallest one. LAN is generally within a building or office building or inside your home, but it's not limited to that. This could be three buildings right next to one another. It could still be a LAN. Um, B is wireless LAN. So B and A is very much the same. The difference here is A is a mix of machines, laptops and desktops and stuff, which could be using LAN cables, remote network cables for the most part, or they could be wirelessly connected to the network. You know, this could be laptops, tablets, and phones. 
where B is exclusively and for the most part just wireless. So that's when it's a LAN, but everybody's just connecting via wireless. There's no cables involved. D, global area network. That's probably the biggest kind of network you can get. And a good example will probably be the internet. Moving on to question 18. One of your users brings their tablet to you because the cursor on it keeps drifting. If you don't know what that means, if you just hold the phone or the laptop or the tablet still, and you start seeing that the cursor on the screen is ever so slightly moving, or it looks like almost like it's shaking or, uh, you know, just moving across the screen ever so slightly slowly. That is generally, if, it, if it's a mouse, if you're an actual wireless mouse or something you've got, it could be that maybe this mouse is on a surface that's too glossy or too reflective from what I've seen, but this is not a mouse to a laptop or a desktop, it is a tablet. And if it's a tablet, it normally needs to be configured properly. It's too sensitive or anything in that regard. So they say you notice that the screen does not appear to be damaged. So that's probably not the issue here. Which of the following is the most likely cause of the issue? Looking at answer A, the touch pin battery is depleted. No. If the battery is depleted, the cursor just won't move at all. Either it's going to move or it's not going to move at all. It's not going to cause any issues if the battery starts getting flat for size. The cursor is no longer moving at all. B says the screen needs to be recalibrated. You need to go and configure the sensitivity and all of that. Yes, the answer is in fact B, guys. C says the screen is physically damaged. No, because literally in the question it said, you notice that the screen does not appear to be damaged. So it can definitely not be C. C is completely and totally and utterly ruled out here. D, the screen rotation is incorrect. No. So this is normally called gyroscope. I've seen on some devices they call it screen rotation, but the actual name for this is gyroscope. So that means this phone or tablet or whatever it is has the ability to detect which side is up and which side is down. And if you maybe go lie on your side in the bed or something, you'll find that the screen of the phone or the tablet is going to rotate automatically unless you turn this thing off automatically. Screen rotation has no influence on your cursor drifting around on the screen. It's not supposed to have an influence on that. Otherwise, everybody would have that, inf that, that issue. Um, everybody would be complaining about it, and yet nobody complains about it. So it's definitely not screen rotation. The answer stays B, guys. Question 19. One of your users reports that they have issues with their phone after dropping it. Ay ay ay, that sounds expensive. After investigating, you notice that the icons on the screen all look normal. But when the user touches the browser icon specifically, for example, nothing happens. So everything looks normal on this screen, but specifically when you or the user touch the browser icon, nothing happens. Which of the following is the most likely cause? Looking at the four answers like usual, the first one says digitizer issues. Now, if you don't know what the digitizer is, guys, that is the most front layer. So if you look at phones and tablets and basically anything that's got a touch screen. So if you have a fancy, expensive laptop that's got a touch screen, uh, believe it or not, it actually has layers the screen. You'll see this most commonly on phones and tablets. It looks like a layer. It just looks like a solid screen to you. But believe it or not, it's got layers. The very outermost layer, that layer is called the digitizer. That is the layer that detects sense. It detects when you go and touch the screen. Most of them actually work of heat, not touch. But some of them do work of touch as well. So the digitizer is what actually detects input. It detects where on the screen you're touching, what you're touching, where you're moving and where you're pinching and zooming in and zooming out. That's the digitizer. So the digitizer has got an issue. It could either not work at all, detect your input at all, or it's going to, well, not detect it properly. So if it's got a crack in a digitizer somewhere, you might find some icons might work and some of them might not work, which is the answer here, by the way. The answer is the digitizer. B says broken screen. Now, if the screen was broken, guys, none of the icons would work. Remember the question said, after investigating, you notice that the icons on the screen all look normal, but when the user touches the browser icon. So that means the other icons work. They specifically say when the user touches the browser icon, nothing happens. So that means the other icons are working. It's not a broken screen because if it was broken, none of them would work. Is it malware? No, because if it was malware, nothing would work. Um, D, overheating? No, because why would overheating only affect certain icons? That makes no sense. Overheating would cause the phone to get warm. It might cause it to get laggy, but it's not going to cause some things to open and some things not to open. You know, 
It's just weird. So the answer is A, digitizer. Question 20. Which of the following 802.11 standards supports both 2.4 gigahertz and 5 gigahertz channel frequencies? All right. Now if you look at answer A, that is 802.11A, it runs at a frequency of 5 gigahertz and only 5 gigahertz. If you look at answer B, 802.11B, it runs at a frequency of 2.4 gigahertz. If you look at answer C, that's answer, that's going to be 802.11G, it runs at a frequency of 2.4 gigahertz. You'll find that a lot of things in life runs at 2.4, it's actually the most common frequency you'll get. And then the last one here, which is the answer, guys, it is able to run both on 2.4 and 5 gigahertz frequencies. It's the only one here that's able to run that. Um, it's not the only frequency out there, though, that can run on both these frequencies. It's the only one in this list. You'll get that there's other frequencies as well, which is not listed here. Uh, for instance, you get 802.11 AC, you get 802.11 AX, which actually came out during the pandemic. If I'm not mistaken, I think it came out in 2021, somewhere around there. So they, those, some of those actually are able to run on both these frequencies as well, but they're not listed. They're not really discussed in A+, quite frankly. But you will learn about them in the N plus course. If any of you guys are planning on taking this further and you're planning on studying for the Network Plus course, you are going to have to know those two frequencies as well. And yes, even though 802.11ax only came out in 2021, it is in the new N plus exam. So you'd be wise to go and learn about that one as well. Moving on to question 21. You are inspecting a projector that is displaying fuzzy images. So it is displaying, it's just fuzzy. Which of the following options would provide the best solution? The first one says reseating the lamp. No. So the lamp, either it's going to work or it's not going to work. You know, reseating it, that's not going to make the fuzziness go away. The only way you can make the fuzziness go away is to sometimes change the lamp. If the lamp is getting old, I've seen sometimes changing the lamp might, you know, change it because the, the bulb might just be failing. Or if you're just going to adjust the focus, you'll find... Um, on fancy cameras and on projectors and things, they've got a focus thing. Normally you have to turn a little lens. It's like a little wheel you've got to spin. And the more you spin it, the more it's going to zoom in or zoom out or focus. It's going to focus. So it's kind of like when you've got a fancy camera and you will see sometimes it blurs a little bit until you focus in or focus out a little bit. Very much the same concept, guys. So that actually is the answer here. So first one says resetting the lamp. No. Second one says replacing the video cables. No, because if there was something wrong with the video cables, it'll either work or it would not work at all. At most, if something was wrong with the video cables, you might just get weird colors because most projectors use VGA cables. Sometimes you might get lucky and they'll use like HDMI or something. And they're assuming they're using VGA, it might have a very red color, very blue or green or yellow color. That means the cable is damaged. Or if the video is just off completely, then it might also be the cable is damaged. But it is working. It's not weird colors. It's just fuzzy. So we can rule out the cables. The last one says changing the input source. Input source, it's not going to change. I mean, at most, the resolution might just be wrong. Um, or it's not going to display anything at all. But it's not going to make the fuzziness go away. The only one that's going to make that go away is adjusting the lens. It needs to be focused. So that's all it needs to happen. It's just a little wheel you're going to spin until you see the fuzziness goes away. You're literally just focusing. Moving on to question 22, boys and girls. One of your fellow technicians wants to migrate all common business applications, including email and file shares, to the cloud. Which of the following cloud concepts should be used? Now, folks, looking at the list in front of us, I can confirm all four of them are legit cloud services. Some people might just say B, C, and D are cloud services because those three are the most common ones you'll find. But A, in fact, is also a cloud service. So M is monitoring as a service. And if you look at B, which is I in the front, the I is infrastructure as a service. C is platform as a service. And D is software as a service. So monitoring as a service, I'm going to rule that out. That's just monitoring software running in a cloud for the most part. So it's all kinds of cool monitoring tools and what have you that allows you to keep an eye on your clients or your users. So we want to move our business applications. We, we're not talking about monitoring anything, so it's definitely not A. We want to move our business applications, including email and file shares. We're talking about applications we want to move to the cloud here. So depending on what you want to move to the cloud, that will dictate what kind of public cloud you want to go and use. 
So A is monitoring the service. That's not it. B is infrastructure as a service. That would be something like a virtual machine. So if you have something like a virtual machine on premises and it's running on your laptop, your desktop, or your server, it's just infrastructure. If you move that to the cloud, like some place like Microsoft's Azure portal, it is then infrastructure as a service because it's no longer using your RAM, your hard drive space, or your CPU cycles. It's using Microsoft's or whoever the cloud provider is. So that's infrastructure as a service since, being, since it's being rendered back to you as a service for a monthly fee. Platform as a service would be probably something like Active Directory. So if you were to go and acquire yourself Active Directory in the cloud, uh, Azure Active Directory, although they've renamed that now to Intra ID, not something you guys need to worry about. But if you have Azure Active Directory in the cloud, which they call Intra ID now, that would be an example of platform as a service. So that's when the cloud provider has done most of the work for you and you just kind of swoop in at the last minute and you reap the benefits. So looking at Active Directory, normally if you want that on premises, you would have to get yourself a physical or a virtual server. You might have to build it. You would have to install the server operating system. You would have to add a role, which is the ADDS role for Active Directory. You would have to promote that domain controller and, and, and. It's not rocket science, but what it is, is it's time consuming. Very, very time consuming. Now, platform as a service takes away all that work and you just kind of swoop into the last minute and you reap the benefits. So you do not need to make a physical or virtual server, install server, or do any of those things I just mentioned. You just swoop in at the last minute, you just hook up your domain, and voila, you can go and create users and groups and do whatever it is you want to go and do. That is platform as a service. So once again, it's not A, B, or C. The answer here, guys, is D, software as a service. So that is if you're running software and applications in the cloud, you do not have access to anything else. That's the one where you've got the least amount of control, but it's not a bad thing. It means it's the cloud provider's responsibility. You just get to shrug your shoulders and say, meh, it's their problem. So it's running somewhere else. It's installed somewhere else, the software, and you or the user get to access it via the internet. That's it. And it's most likely going to be streamed via something like a browser or whatever. So from the comfort of your seat, you can just go and access it over the internet. You can have the world's slowest and oldest computer known to man as long as you've got a screen as long as you've got an internet connection, you can run that software. So it gets around issues of regards to storage. It gets around issues regarding um, compatibility, all that kinds of stuff. So it's got so many benefits. It feels like I'm selling you guys something, but I'm not. It just really is. It is something great that I would like you guys to go and check out if you haven't done it already. Moving on to question 23, boys and girls. Which of the following would be the best reason to use a virtual machine as a sandbox. Now, if you don't know what we mean by sandbox in IT, sandbox in IT is normally if we get to test something in a safe environment, and I feel like I'm giving you guys the answer now. I mean, if you look at the available answers here, I think you guys can guess the answer now. So sandbox environment is the actual term we say, is if I have something that I would like to go and test, but I don't want to test that something on my real computer, my real laptop or desktop, or my real server or my real environment, because it might break something. It might be dangerous, it might be malware, or it might have a configuration or a setting or a something that could potentially break something in my real production environment. So that is why we use sandbox environments. It's an isolated environment normally. It's a safe environment normally where we can go and freely and safely test something that needs to be tested. And if we like the results and it turns out not to be harmful and we like the results and the performance and all that jazz, then we can go and do it in a real environment. So looking at the answer A here, it says to increase the efficient use of computing resources. Absolutely not. It's got nothing to do with that. B says to test software in a safe environment. <laughs> yes, that's the answer. C, to have dedicated hardware for a single system. No. And D, to run multiple machines on the same hardware. So if you want to run multiple machines on the same hardware, that would be uh, virtual machines, you know. So virtual machines in general, let me, let me put it that way. So that would be something like Hyper-V. Uh, it might be VMware, Virtual Box, Virtual PC, Oracle. You get many of those kinds of things. Which of the following would most likely be used to connect one or more devices to the internet in a small office, home office environment? Is it a hub? No. That's to connect devices to one another inside a network. And it's a very old device. It's a very dumb device. Is it a wireless access point? 
Uh, no. That might be one of the devices you're going to go through, but it is not the actual device that connects you or other devices to the internet. That is just what connects you to the network. Is it a switch? No. A switch is very much like a hub, except a switch is a little bit smarter than a hub, and a hub is basically extinct. It connects you to the network. So it's like a wireless access point, if you think about it. A wireless access point connects you wirelessly to the network. A switch connects you to the network via cable. They do the exact same thing. The one is wireless, the other one is wired, but it just connects you to the network, not necessarily the internet. And an answer D is the router. Yes, that is the bridge between you and the internet or the users in the internet. It is what gets you from your private network to the public network, which is the internet. It's the bridge. The answer here, guys, is D, router. Question 25. You must configure a new small office home office router for a small business. The ISP of the client has given you an IP address on the router's WAN port. Now, the WAN port, guys, is the port on the router that goes to the outside world. You'll find that most routers have got five LAN ports on the, at the back of it. Four of them are right next to one another. Those are normal LAN ports on the inside of your network. So if you have a desktop or something that you would like to connect to the internet, you would plug it into one of those four LAN ports. Or if you've got a switch and you want to go and expand your network, you would plug it into one of those four um, LAN ports. Um, the fifth port is normally a little bit separate you know, from the other four ports. And it actually has WAN written next to it. It says WAN port or WAN on it. That is a network cable that goes to the outside world, if you want to call it that. Now, the question says you must configure a new Soho router for a small business. The ISP, so that's the internet service provider of your client, has given you an IP address that you need to go and basically configure on that WAN port. Which of the following addresses did you most likely go and configure now? So remember, that router is the device between you and the internet or the client and the internet. It's what allows them to get to the internet. It's the gateway. It is the bridge, and the WAN port is the one that goes to the outside world. So remember that. That's important for this answer. So looking at the four answers here, guys. A has got an IP address of 169.254, etc., etc. That is a PIPA. Any IP address that starts with 169.254 is a PIPA. A P I P A, a PIPA. That is when this device is set to dynamic, not static, and it's supposed to get an IP on a network, but it's unable to get one. Why it's unable to get one, we don't know. That could be for any amount of reason. Maybe it's just plugged out, disconnected, signal's too weak, whatever. The point is, it's unable to get an IP. And if and when a device on network is unable to get an IP for whatever reason, it will have what we call a PIPA. Think of it as a bookmark or a placeholder until such time where it can get an IP address. So you're specifically looking at the, four, the first two octets out of the four there, which says 169.254, a PIPA. The second IP address there, is a private IP address. It's a class B IP address. At least by default, it is seen as a class B. It's not set in stone, but in the A plus exam, any IP address that's 172.16. something. something, it is a private IP address. That's set in stone, and it's normally seen as class B. That's not set in stone, but the A plus course and the A plus exam sees it as class B. In real life, you can actually use this class C, you can use this class A. It's all going to be determined by your subnet mask. But the A-plus exam sees that as a class B by default, and most of the world see this class B by default. Answer C, 1945, blah, blah, blah. That actually is the answer here, and I'll mention that in just a moment why. And then moving to answer D here, 10 dot something dot something dot something. That is a private IP address, but it's a class A IP address. So if you see 10 dot something dot something dot something, it's normally private, that means it's an IP inside your home or your business, and it's normally class A, at least by default it's class A, it's not set in stone. If you see 172.16 something something, it's also private, so it's also inside your home or your business, except that's class B by default. And if you see 192.168.0. something, that is normally class C, and it's also private inside your home or your business. So 10 something 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 class A, 172.16 something something class B, and 192.168.0 something something is class C. So all three of them are private, they're all three inside your network, the one is just class A, B, and C, the 169.254, that's normally a PIPA, 172.001, that's normally a loopback IP, and any other IP address you see in the exam, 
is probably going to be a public IP address. That's what you've got on the outside world. So as soon as you or the user go through the router to the outside world, your IP changes from private to public. That is something you get from the ISP, like the question says here, and that's what allows you to browse the outside world and all that kinds of jazz. So any IP you do not recognize in the exam, guys, is probably going to be a public IP address. And the only one on this list that I don't recognize is C, and that is, as you can see, the answer. Oh, just by the way, guys, you need to know IP addresses off by heart when you go write this exam. You need to know your wireless standards off by heart. So wireless standards wise, you need to know 802.11a, .b, g, n. The other two, you don't need to know that, that badly, but those four, you need to know them off by heart. You need to know their, their maximum speeds. You need to know their frequencies. You need to know the uses, their pros, their cons, and um, network cables. You need to know them all. You need to know their speeds, their maximum distances, when we use them, their pros, their cons, and then when it comes to IP addresses as well. You need to know all the different kinds of IPs you get. Um, I wouldn't say it's compulsory that you know how to work them out. Not so badly for, for A+. It will help you, but it's not, a, it's not a deal breaker. But you do need to know the different kinds of IP addresses you get. In other words, IP bar, loopback, class A, B, and C, private IP, public IP, dynamic IP, static IP. Uh, if you don't know those that I just listed, guys, make sure you know all of those before you go and write the exam. If you don't feel comfortable with those, do not go and write the exam. You need to know all of those I just listed. I'm going to list it again for you guys. You need to know what a public IP is. You need to know what a private IP address is. You need to know what a dynamic is, a dynamic IP address. You need to know what a fixed IP is, which they also know, call a, a manual IP or a static IP sometimes. You need to know what a class A IP, class B IP, class C IP address is, and then of course loop back and I'll peep on all those. So yeah, make sure you know all of those guys before you write the exam. Now speaking of which, question 26. 127.0.0.1 is an example of what? So I just gave you guys the answer because I gave you quite a thorough explanation, explanation there. So the first answer there is a peep -up. What does a PIPA look like? It's 169.254. something or something. So it's not A. Uh, B says loopback IP. Yes. 127.0.0.1 is a loopback IP. That is when you want to test your own TCP IP stack or if you want to go and test your own native card. You're basically pinging yourself. Answer C says private IP. No. So if it was a private IP, it will probably be 192.168.0 something or 172.16 something or 10 dot something that's something. That would be a private IP address. It's none of those three, so it's not that. Public IP will be any IP address we do not recognize, and I do recognize that IP, so it's not a public IP address. Question 27. You are diagnosing a PC that shuts down unexpectedly during a burn-in test. So a burn-in test is normally something we do on new machines, but it's not limited to new machines. So if you just built a brand spanking new computer for a client, uh, you normally go and do what we call a burn test. You push that PC to its limits. One of the things that we push to the limit is normally going to be the RAM. You, you push that RAM to its limits and you just want to check if the RAM is actually working fully. Just because it's new doesn't mean it's working fully. You sometimes get duds. Now we do sometimes do this on PCs we fixed recently as well, where we just do a burn in test just to check if the RAM and all that's working correctly, graphics cards working correctly, CPUs working correctly. So which of the following is the most likely cause for the symptom? Is it a faulty CMOS battery? No. A burn-in test does not test the CMOS battery. And if there is something wrong with the CMOS battery, you'd find that the PC will just not remember the boot order, but it's still going to be able to boot. And you'd find that it does not remember the BIOS password. And um, what else is going to happen? Oh yeah, the system time is going to be incorrect. It's going to keep falling behind. But other than that, the PC is going to work just fine. Is it... Operating system update issues. No, that's going to have no influence on the PC that just shuts down unexpectedly. Uh, it's not going to have an influence on the burning test. Overheating. No. I don't think that's the answer. I'm not going to rule it out because overheating can cause a PC to shut down unexpectedly. So if a PC gets too hot, especially during a, I mean, a burning test, is going to be pushing a PC to its limit. So it's going to get a little hotter than usual. Uh, but normally, that would not be a cause. Normally, the fan would kick in just like normal. Or whatever cooling system that machine went in has in it supposed to kick in at normal, like normal. So it's less likely to be the issue. I'm not saying it is not the issue. If there was other answers in here which look like duds, I would probably choose overheating because it could be an answer. 
but it's not likely to be an answer. The question specifically says, what is most likely going to cause the symptom? And that would be a faulty ramp chip because this question specifically says they're doing a burn-in test, which means it's going to test things like the ram. The whole purpose of it is, is to test things like the ram. And if the ram is faulty, it's going to bomb out on you and the piece is going to shut down. So the most likely answer here is going to be the ram. But if ram was not listed as a possible answer here, I would have gone with overheating. But generally, pushing a PC to its limit, it's not supposed to overheat because the normal cooling system is supposed to keep it within its normal operating limits, I would say. All right, moving on. Question 28. One of your users reports limited or no connectivity on their computer. You run the ipconfig command with the following result. So that ipconfig command, for those of you that don't know, is something you would go and type in the command prompt. It gives you a basic overview of that machine's networking configuration. Now, doing so shows us the result of, well, 169.254.213.242 as the IP address with a subnet mask of 225.5.0. And uh, obviously, there's no default gateway. Which of the following is most likely the cause of this issue? Okay, so what's the issue again? limited or no connectivity on the machine all right so we've got a configuration there it shows 169.254 blah 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 uh, is it a dhcp failure so far i'm inclined to think that because 169.254 is a pipa a pipa is something you get when you're unable to get an ip address why you're unable to get an ip address i don't know it could be that your network cable is unplugged if you're working with a cable if you are on wi-fi Maybe the signal is too weak. Maybe you're disconnected. Maybe the DHCP has run out of IP addresses. It can be any amount of reasons. The point here is you're unable to get an IP for some reason. And when you don't have an IP address, you're not going to be able to connect to the network. In fact, that is the answer here. It's going to say limited or no, no connectivity. Um, you'll see it's going to show you that you are connected to a certain degree. So if it's a network cable, you'll see the little computer icon. But in most cases, it's going to show a yellow exclamation mark there. And that normally means limited or no connectivity. So it's plugged in, but there's some sort of problem. Duplicate IP address is not the answer. I mean, because we know the answer is A now. If you had a duplicate IP, that would be an IP address conflict. Normally, your PC would pop up with a notification telling you there's an IP address conflict. And it would kick you off the network as well as the other machine off the network. Both devices would have no connectivity. And you would get a notification that says duplicate IP or IP conflict. Is it the Active Directory? No, Active Directory's got nothing to do with this. Active Directory is what basically has your user accounts and your groups and your group policies and all that. So if you're unable to log in, yes, that could potentially be an Active Directory issue. Although not being able to log in might not indicate an Active Directory issue. You would see even if there is an Active Directory issue, the user is still able to log in normally because it caches those details. So the last account the person logged in with, which is normally their own, um, that account would still work because it's going to be cached. Um, is it the DNS resolution issue that's converting IPs to names and names to IPs? Uh, no, the symptoms for that would be entirely different. You would still be able to access local network resources. You would not get that error message of limited or no connectivity. Instead, when you try and open web pages and stuff, that's when you're going to start encountering a DNS resolution issue, or at least the symptoms thereof. You might find that if you type in the actual address for a website, let's say Facebook or YouTube, it might not work, but if you type in the IP address of Facebook or YouTube, then it will work just fine. That would be an, indicating, an indication that, you know what, you probably have a DNS resolution issue. It's not resolving the name and all that. Moving on to question 29. You are receiving reports that one section of the office sporadically loses native connectivity. I'm hoping I'm pronouncing that word correctly. I don't think I am. So it's, it's basically going off and on at random times and all that. You investigate and determine that EMI is the root cause here. So that's electromagnetic interference. Which of the following cable mediums would be the best if avoiding EMI was the only factor? All right, so it specifically says if avoiding EMI, so that we want to avoid EMI, but that's the only factor here. It says that at the end. The last part says avoiding EMI is the absolute only factor here. All right. So is it coaxial cable? Hoping I'm pronouncing that correctly. No, because that's legacy. 
uh, it does avoid EMI to a certain extent. It is somewhat immune to EMI, but it's not fully immune to EMI. It's old legacy cable. Is it B, UTP, CAT5E? No. So that is a network cable, but it's unshielded twisted pair. The UTP means it's unshielded. So that's probably the least one. So out of the four answers I see there, the last, last, last one I would choose if EMI is an issue would be B because it's got no shielding whatsoever. A, C, and D is immune to it. It's just a matter of how much immune they are and all that. So A is immune, but not completely. B is absolutely not immune. C is shielded twisted pair. It's immune, but it's more modern. It's newer and it's faster than coaxial. So if I had to choose between A and C, I would choose C because it's more modern. Uh, it's also not completely immune. It's about the same as coaxial, but it's modern and it's faster than all that. D is the answer here. It's fiber. It does not work with copper, unlike the other three answers. So A, B, and C works with copper. D is fiber. It uses glass and light. It's the only one out of these answers which is completely 100% immune to EMI. It's absolutely not influenced by EMI whatsoever. So if you want to avoid EMI, and the only factor here is avoiding EMI, yes, fiber would be your best answer. But in real life, we don't normally choose fiber because there's other factors to consider. Factors like maybe distance, cost, that kinds of stuff. In real life, fiber would probably be way too expensive to go and use in an office environment. It's just stupid expensive. Yes, it's the best one for the job, uh, it's it's very expensive. On that note, that brings us to the next question here. Question 30. You are receiving reports that one section of the office sporadically loses network connectivity throughout the day. So it's kind of the same scenario as question 29. You investigate and determine that EMI is the root cause. So same issue, more or less. Same problem, more or less. And this time it says, which of the following cable mediums would be the most cost effective without sacrificing system performance. So you can see it's kind of the same scenario we've got here, except this time we've got other factors to consider. Last time, the only thing we had to avoid was EMI, and we would obviously just choose the most effective one. Now we can't because we've got to consider cost here, and we also have to consider performance here. We don't want to sacrifice performance, but we also don't want to cost, you know, pay an arm and a leg here. So coaxial, it's immune to a certain extent, but we're going to sacrifice performance. Coaxial is very old technology. It's legacy. So we're not going to use A because it does not meet that requirement of sacrificing performance. We don't want to sacrifice performance. Is it B? Absolutely not because B is not immune to EMI. So that's just going to, you know, nothing's going to change there. Is it C? Yes. C is modern. It is somewhat immune to EMI. It's the most cost effective here and you're not going to sacrifice performance. If you look at D, yes, it is going to avoid EMI. And yes, you would not be sacrificing performance, but it is not the most cost effective. It does not meet the requirement, which specifically says the word most in capital letters there. It says most cost effective. Fiber is the best cable for the job, but it's not the most cost effective cable for the job. Most cost effective would be the next one in the row, which is STP. Moving on to question 31. You are receiving reports from a user that complains about their phone. After investigating, you notice the phone is hot to the touch, even when not in use, and that it also does not retain a charge. So if you charge the phone's battery, you know, it just doesn't keep the charge. It's just flat in no time or it just doesn't charge at all. The user also complains the phone is very slow. Which of the following is the most likely cause for the symptoms? So there might be more than one possible answer here, but we want to know which one is the most likely one. Is it a broken charging port? I would say no. The, the question says, does not retain a charge. It does not say it does not charge. So from if I read the question correctly, it does not retain charge, which means it is in fact charging. It's just not retaining the charge. So I'm going to rule out A, broken charging port, since it does sound like it has, is actually charging. B, digitizer failure. No, digitizer, as I said earlier in this video, digitizer is the, is the outermost um, layer of your screen for a touch screen, which is able to sense touch. So that is used for, you know, basically giving input to the screen. So if there's something wrong with the digitizer, you will be complaining that if they touch the screen, the phone is not responding in some sort of way. Um, but they're talking about keeping a charge, and the phone getting hot, 
Digitize has got nothing to do with your charging or retaining a charge. It's got nothing to do with the heat of your phone. It's completely unrelated. So I'm going to rule out A. I'm going to rule out B. C says CPU's overheating. Um, okay, it's plausible, but I don't think that's the answer. I think the answer here is D. Uh, retaining a charge, I mean, it could, it could be the CPU is just running a lot here. I mean, it really could be. If the CPU is running a lot, it would get hot. I mean, CPU is very busy. It does sometimes make a, well, like a phone hot. So if you're playing heavy games on your phone, you might find it will start getting a little hot. And obviously, if the CPU is very busy, it's going to drain the battery. So that would explain not reta uh, retaining a charge. But there's a but. The question says, even if the phone is not in use. So if it's not in use, the CPU would not be busy. If the CPU is not busy, it would not be overheating. And that does not explain then, you know, why it's getting hot and why it's losing charge. If the CPU is not busy, it would not lose a charge then because of the CPU and would not get hot because of the CPU. So it says even when not in use. So that kind of rules out answer C then if you think about it that way. So the only answer that's left here by process of elimination is answer D, a defective battery. And if I had to guess, that would have actually been my first choice anyway. Normally, if a phone does not keep a charge, it means the battery is old or it's now defective. If it starts getting hot, that could also be a sign of a battery. Although I've seen sometimes it's just firmware updates that does that. But it's most likely a defective battery. It does not retain a charge. It does not want a charge. It starts getting slow because it's not discharging properly. So when you start using the phone, it needs to discharge the, uh, the electricity from the battery properly. And if it doesn't do that properly, you're going to start experiencing lag and slow performance on the phone as well. Question 32. What is the first step in the troubleshooting model? So there's actually six steps in a troubleshooting model. There used to only be four. Only four steps is listed here, but there's actually six in the current A plus version. So if you go look at the, the 1100 series of A plus, which is what we're doing now, if you were to go and look at a manual, if you were, or if you were to go and look it up online, there are six troubleshooting steps. And uh, I only have listed four here for you guys. What is the first step? So I'm going to give you a scenario so we can make this easier to figure out. A user complains that he or she cannot start a computer. The computer just does not want to start. So if he or she complains the computer does not want to start, looking at the four answers I've given you guys on the screen, what would you do first? Would you test the theory? You know, that's answer A. Uh, I suppose, but what theory? There is no theory. So you're going to test the theory, but you don't even have a theory yet. So it's not A. You have to first establish a theory. So I can already tell you C is going to be before A because you have to first establish a theory before you can test it. Is it B, identify the problem? Well, maybe. But to be able to identify the problem, you need to have a theory first. So C is still going to be before B. And then D says verify system functionality. That sounds more like something you would do towards the end after you fixed this problem. So the first thing you would do here, guys, out of these four answers is to establish a theory. If someone says the machine does not want to start or whatever the issue might be at hand, you first need to establish a theory as to what might have caused that. One of the ways we do that, this is not the only way, is to ask questions. So if you're lucky enough to have the user there, and if you're lucky enough to be able to ask them questions, ask them a couple of questions. That's the quickest and the easiest and the best way to, well, establish a theory. If you ask them questions like, sir, ma'am, how long has this problem been around? When did you first encounter this? Is there anything specific you do on a machine that causes this problem? Now, in this case, I don't think so because I said it just doesn't start at all. So I'll probably ask them questions like, okay, when did this start? How long did this, has this been happening? And if they say, you know what? It's been happening ever since yesterday or ever since this morning. Yesterday afternoon, I was working fine. And ever since we had that storm last night, my PC doesn't want to start this morning. Uh-huh. So we've got a time frame. We know it's something that happened between yesterday afternoon and this morning. And user mentions there was a storm last night. So what do you guys think it is? It's most likely some sort of lightning strike or some sort of power surge. And that 10 to 1 has damaged this machine in some sort of way. It probably damaged the power supply. Might have been the motherboard, but it's most likely the power supply that took a knock here. The power supply is kaput. It kicked the bucket. And I suspect the power supply needs to be replaced now. So that's my theory. Now the next step after that would be, not that you need to know, to test my theory. See, I would go and grab a working power supply after that and plug it in and check if the PC starts. If it starts, you move on to the next step because then you've confirmed your theory. If it does not start, you start back at step A again or, you know, first step again and you go and establish a new theory. 
Now, but if it does start, you would probably move on to establish a plan of action, which is not even listed here. So what am I going to do about this problem? You need to go and replace the problem, right? Or fix the problem. Anyway, folks, moving on to the next question. 33. Which of the following is an example of a class B IP address? Uh -huh. Now, do you, any of you guys remember what that one is? Because I did explain it earlier in this video. You're welcome to go back to that question number if you can remember which question it is. I can't even remember which question it was. But I know earlier we explained IP addresses quite thoroughly. So which one would it be here? Is it A, 192.168.0.something? No. That is a private IP address, but it's a class C IP address. At least by default, according to A+, it's seen as a class C IP address. 172.16 something something. That's seen as a private IP, but it's seen as, as class B by default. So that's going to be the answer. And I'm looking at answer C there. 10 something something something. Also a private IP address, but it's seen as a class A by default. And then the last one there, answer D, is 169.254 something something. That is seen as a PIPA. That is when, whenever you or the device is unable to get an IP address for some sort of reason, and then you are given what we call an APIPA. All right, moving on. Question 54, another IP address one. Now, why am I asking you so much about IP addresses? Because you need to know this for the exam. It is really flipping important for the exam. So I would advise you guys to go and check the first version of this video, which had 50 questions. You guys are watching version two, which has got 60 questions. Version 1 had 50 questions, so go and combine that 50 questions with the 60 questions of this video. And then maybe if you're lucky, I'll release a, release a version 3, maybe even a version 4 later down the line. I'm thinking of doing that. But if you haven't watched version 1 yet of this video, guys, please go watch version 1. It's got different questions. It's got another 50 questions in it. And you combine that 50 questions with the 60 questions in this video. Make sure you're comfortable of all the topics in all 110 questions. If you do not feel comfortable, with one of the topics or some of the topics in 110 questions, please do not go and write the first exam. Um, that might not end very well for you. Go look up the topics, go look for another videos. It can be mine, it can be someone else's videos, it doesn't matter. As long as you look up those topics until you feel comfortable with those topics. Now getting back to the topic at hand here, IP addresses and all that. The following is an example of what kind of address. Now that is an address I don't recognize. And if it's something I don't recognize, what did I say is it? It's a public IP. So if it's something I recognize, it'll be any one of those other IP addresses I've mentioned to you guys. But as soon as it's something I don't recognize, it's most likely a public IP address. So that's going to be answer C. So A, a PIPA would be 169.254.something.something. .something .something. If it was B, a loopback IP, it would be 127.0.0.1. Public IP is something you don't recognize. And a private IP would normally be 192.168.0.something, which is also class C. Or it could be 172.16.something.something, which is class B. Or it could be 10.something.something.something, which is class A. So since I don't recognize it, it's a public IP, guys. Moving on to question 35. What is the minimum number of hard drives required to be able to run RAID 1? Do you need a minimum of 1, a minimum of 2, 3, or four. All right, guys, so an A plus, you for the most part just need to know RAID 0, RAID 1, and RAID 5. You do get other kinds of RAIDs there as well. And they've got different benefits to them. They're used for different purposes. They've got different amounts of hard drives they require. But normally the minimum amount of hard drives you need for any form of RAID is two. Some of them you need a minimum of three or maybe even more. So RAID 0 needs a minimum of two hard drives, which is used for performance. It does something called striping. RAID 1 needs a minimum of two hard drives as well. It does something called mirroring. So RAID 0 is used for performance. It does something called striping. RAID 1 is used for redundancy or reliability. It does something called mirroring. It's basically a clone. Also needs a minimum of two hard drives. And RAID 5 needs a minimum of three hard drives. It does striping. It does mirroring. It uses a concept called parity bit. And um, RAID 5 is normally something we'll use in service. It's actually the most common one I've seen used in service because of its affordability. But if you could afford better than that, you'd find your organization would actually go higher than RAID 5. RAID 0 and 1 is something you can actually do in a desktop PC, but it's kind of extinct now in desktop PCs. Uh, instead, we'll use other forms of reliability and performance in desktop PC. If you want speed in a desktop PC, you'll probably use a solid-state drive. 
you want reliability, you'll probably use a backup of some kind and not a secondary hard drive. Anyway, moving on. Question 36. What is the maximum distance a network cable, in other words, CAT5, that's category 5, can go without being repeated? Now, whether we're talking about CAT5, CAT5E, CAT6, CAT6A, CAT7, CAT8, you'll find the majority of these cables can go a maximum of 100 meters. So CAT5, 5E, 6, 6A, the maximum they can go according to the manual, according to the courses, according to the exam, is 100 meters. In other words, 328 feet, guys. That's what the theory says. But in reality, you'll never get 100 meters in real life. But the exam doesn't care about real life. It cares about what the book says. It cares about theory. There's a difference between real life and book knowledge. And this is now, well, where that basically comes into play. So if the exam asks you guys, it's 100 meters for any form of LAN cable. Just choose 100 meters for all the LAN cable types and you'll always get the answer right in the exam. But just know in real life, <laughs> you're not gonna get 100 meters. The absolute best, best case scenario, you'll get 80 to 90 meters. Um, if you get 90 meters, I would like to you know, meet you. I would like to know how the heck you got that because normally you're not gonna get 90 meters. Um, generally, the average person gets 70 meters, 80 meters. It's gonna depend on a couple of variables. It's going to depend on whether that cable uses solid copper or flexi copper. So if you expose the eight wires and you cut them open, is it a solid copper strand or is it multiple copper strands? So is it flexi copper or solid copper? It's also going to depend on whether this cable is going near any devices or environments that give off EMI. So if it's going to be near power cables or anything that gives off EMI, fluorescent lights, you know, that kind of stuff. Yes, that's also going to drastically reduce the maximum distance you can get out of this cable, guys. So the answer here, guys, is B, 100 meters. Question 37. Which of the following should be used to prevent ESD from taking place? So ESD is electrostatic discharge. So the human body, for those of you that don't know this part yet, maybe you didn't watch my course, the human body has enough static electricity in it to blow circuitry. Circuit boards like the motherboard in the computer, RAM chips, graphics cards. So if you just go and willy-nilly touch these circuit boards, you could actually blow them, even if they're not plugged in. Yes, you can blow them. So how do we avoid that? There's various ways you can go about doing it. Now, what the exam and the manuals and the courses tell us to go and do is not really what most of us do in real life. But once again, the exam is based on book knowledge, and that's what I'm going to teach you guys. So the course and the exam requires you guys to use what we call an anti-static wrist strap. Real life, nobody really uses that. If you use that, once again, let me know in the comment section down below because normally I almost never ever see someone using that. You could alternatively also use what we call rubber mats. So you put this PC in question on a rubber mat, you ground yourself, and that's why we use the anti-static wrist strap. You put it around your wrist, you put it around your ankle, and it's got a little cable that clips onto something that's grounded, and there you go. Now you can go touch the, the motherboard or whatever piece of circuitry that you're working with, and you're not gonna blow that component. What do we do in real life, though? Then just in case you're curious, since we already know the answer here is A, in real life, we just touch the inside of the case. So if you open a desktop PC and you just slide it off the back panel or the side panel, you touch the inside of the frame, not the outside, the inside. The outside, although sometimes made out of metal, it's not always conductive metal. If you touch the inside of the frame, that would discharge into the frame of the case safely. It's not going to blow the motherboard, anything when you do that. And then you can go and touch the circuit boards and stuff. But as soon as you walk away from that case, even if it's just two steps, just to go pick up a screwdriver or something, you need to discharge again. So the beginning, it's going to require a lot of concentration to be able to do that. It's like remembering to put it on a safety belt in your car. In the beginning, when you just start driving, you need to remember to do that. But as time goes by, it's going to start becoming muscle memory. And the same applies to building pieces and working on pieces. In the beginning, you're going to have to concentrate on this to remember to do that. And as time goes by, you're going to do it instinctively without even thinking about it. I'm at a point in my career now where I do it without even thinking about it. And that's where you guys will eventually end up at. Moving on to question 38. Which of the following printers uses toner to print? And you'll find the further we go of these questions, the more questions we cover, eventually, somewhere along the line, these things do overlap. So, yes, the exam has maybe 300 or 500 possible questions they can ask you. But in reality, it's not actually that many. That The amount of topics they're asking about might only be 50 or 100 topics. And they just keep asking you the same stuff over and over. And they just keep phrasing it differently or asking you from a different angle. And they're testing you in from different ways. 
So this is something we have covered in this video, and I believe we might even have covered in the other practice question video that I made for you guys. But I know for a fact in the beginning part of this video, maybe the first 10 questions somewhere or so, we did cover this part already from a different perspective. So if you paid attention there, you would actually know what the answer here is. Which of the following printers uses toner to print? So starting at the top guys, dot matrix printers, which are also known as impact printers, they use what we call ribbons. It's that special kind of paper that's made out of ink basically for the most part. So it's not that one. B, which is an inkjet printer, they use liquid ink, they don't use toner. So it's like a toner cartridge, oh no, a normal cartridge has got liquid black ink in it or liquid color ink in it. Um, answer C, laser, that uses toner, so that's the answer here. And thermal printers, they use like a special kind of wax based paper, you know, ink for the most part. It's a special kind of wax. Moving on to question 39. You are commissioning a workstation that is required to have mirrored storage utilizing two four terabyte drives that support one failure. Which of the following best meets these requirements? Is it RAID 0, RAID 1, RAID 2? Or RAID 5. Now, just a couple of questions ago, I did explain to you guys what RAIDs you need to know for this course. And I mentioned to you guys you need to know RAID 0, RAID 1, and RAID 5. The other ones with the higher numbers are normally going to require more hard drives and they're way more expensive, but they've got way more benefits, of course. RAID 2 does not exist. It's not a real thing. It's, it's nonsense. So RAID 0 and 1 and 5, those do exist. RAID 0 and RAID 1, they both require a minimum of two hard drives. RAID 5 requires a minimum of three hard drives. So we can already, already rule out RAID 5 as well because it needs a minimum of three hard drives. And the question mentions you're utilizing two hard drives. So the only ones you can use here is RAID 0 and RAID 1 because they both need a minimum of two hard drives. RAID 0 is used for performance. RAID 1 is used to give you redundancy. It's going to make a clone. It does mirroring and all that. So the answer here, guys, is RAID 1. Because if we read a question again, it says you're commissioning a workstation, blah, 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 to have mirrored storage. You need mirrored storage. So this person or group of people are trying to achieve redundancy here. And that's going to be RAID 1. All right, question 40. You have been tasked with installing an IP phone in a small office with an unmanaged switch. So that's cheap switch. When connected to an RJ45 receptacle, the phone does not boot. Which of the following is the quickest way to resolve this issue? So if you don't know what an IP phone is, you'll find that the majority of companies these days actually have IP phones. Instead of plugging a good old fashioned POTS telephone line into it, so that's the old telephone lines, instead of plugging that into your telephone, you're plugging in a network cable. Most likely Cat5 or Cat6 or something in that regard. You're plugging in a network cable into your phone. And you'll find in most office environments, as soon as you're plugging that network cable into the phone, the phone automatically turns itself on without you plugging a power cable into that. Now, how that's able to happen is because they are sending power through the network cable. A network cable on its own, if you just plug into a normal switch, like an unmanaged switch, like the question states, it's not going to get the job done. An unmanaged switch is a cheap switch. As soon as you connect everybody to that switch of a network cable, they would generally be on the same network, assuming IP addresses and all that's configured correctly, but that's all it does. When you get managed switches, which are more expensive, they allow you to log into them, and you can go and configure all kinds of things. And then you get what we call a POE switch. So if you plug a network cable into one of those switches, they cost you more money. Not only are people connected to one another, but that switch also sends power into the network cable. And if you connect something else to the other side of that network cable, something that needs power, like an IP phone, it would actually automatically turn it on. This is especially useful for environments that's got IP phones, which is most companies, or if you've got access points. Because where do you normally find access points? You normally find them on the ceiling or up high somewhere. Getting a network cable there to the access point, that's not a problem because the network cables are in the walls and in the ceiling anyway. But getting power there is a bit of a conundrum if you think about it because it's not going to be a plug to go and plug it into so where are you going to get power for the access point we are going to send it through the network cable so if it's a medium to a large organization it's most likely going to be an actual proper poe switch that's that's what you're going to go and plug it into but in a small office home office environment or in your home 
if you need to power something via into cable, we use these little PoE boxes. It's a small little box. I'll show you guys a picture of the PoE box, PoE box in the switch in just a moment. So the answer here, guys, is you need to install a PoE injector. So since they want to turn on a phone, and since they're plugging in an RJ45 and it does not turn it on, I mean, they said it's an unmanaged switch. It's a cheap switch. It does not send power into the cable. So they want to be able to plug a cable in and into cable, and the phone must turn itself on. So we need to go and install something uh, that's going to be able to put power into the cable. It's going to be either a PoE switch or it's going to be a PoE injector. So they've got an answer here that says install PoE injector. That's going to be the answer. If you look at answer A there, it says upgrade Ethernet cable to the latest specification. That's not going to make a difference. Whether you're using CAT5, CAT6, it might just get faster and faster the cable, but it's not going to send power into the cable until you connect it to the right device that's able to send power into it, like a PoE injector. B says replace the phone. No, replacing the phone is not going to make a difference. Would I've got one IP phone, another IP phone, either way, the, the phone is not going to turn on if there's not a device that's not sending power into the cable in the, the day. D says change ports on the switch. No, that's not going to make a difference. It's still in the same switch, which is an unmanaged switch, which does not send power into the cable. Changing ports will not have any difference here. There's no, no going to be not going to be any difference there, guys. So as for the pictures, there's a little bit of a picture of a little PoE box. So you plug one end of your netkit cable into the one port and the part, the other cable, you're going to have to have a second cable here. You'll see that there's a little right port there that says power over Ethernet or just power. That's the cable you're going to plug into your, your IP phone. So the one on the right, that's going to go into your IP phone. It says PoE that port in most cases. Plug that into the phone or the access point. And the other cable plugs into the PC or the switch or whatever it normally would go and plug in. As for a PoE switch, there's a picture of a PoE switch. It's not the best, I think this is an 8 port, but you'll find in a proper company environment these, these switches are like 16 ports, 32 ports, or you know, 48 ports. They've got way more ports than an actual proper company environment, and these switches normally cost way more money as well. All right, question 41. Which of the following describes the operational difference between hubs and switches when transmitting data to a specific computer inside the network? Now, before I read the possible answers out to you guys, Hubs is not really something we work with anymore. We instead only work with switches these days because hubs are dumb. And that's probably that's pretty much what this question is all about. Um, even though we don't actually work with hubs anymore, for some strange reason, the A-plus course still covers hubs and the A-plus exam still asks you about hubs. Now, I find that weird because normally the A-plus exam only asks you about stuff that we still actually use in the industry. And you would think by this version of A-plus being the 1100 version of A-plus, they would have kind of, you know, removed hubs from the course, but yet it's still in here and nobody uses them. So a hub is a very dumb device. Just remember that. So which of the following describes the operational difference between hubs and switches? Looking at answer A, switches only send data to the specific computer, while hubs send data to all computers in the network. Yes, that is the answer here. Answer B here says switches compress data while hubs send uncompressed data. No. So they don't do that. Switches don't compress data. Hubs don't send uncompressed data. Well, they do send uncompressed data, but switches don't compress data. Um, answer C. Switches receive data and route it to all computers inside the network while hubs receive data and do not route. No. And then the last one here is switches scramble data while hubs send data in the original form. No. So B, C, and D is completely false. If you are using a hub, it's a dumb device, and if you send information to someone or something on a network, that hub broadcasts that information out of all of its ports. All of the devices on the network would receive that data. So you'll see there it says, while hubs send data to all computers inside the network. So the second part of the first answer says, while hubs send data to all computers inside the network. Yes, hubs broadcast out of all of its ports. They're a dumb device. So that's one of the reasons why they're extinct. Switches, on the other hand, very clever. They only send the data to the device who it was intended for, which is one of the reasons why we stopped using hubs and now we're just using switches. All right, moving on. Question 42. You receive a ticket which indicates that a user's computer is not booting. You initially suspect a failed hard drive. You perform diagnostics and confirm that the hard drive is indeed fully operational. Which of the following steps should you complete next? 
Is it A, reinstall the operating system? Remember, the computer is not booting. That's the issue here. Reinstalling the operating system is not going to solve that problem, guys. It depends on what the issue is. So assuming it was an operating system issue, let's assume for a moment it was an operating system issue. The computer would still boot. It's still going to start, but it's going to display an issue of the operating system. It's going to tell you, okay, well, you know what? This is the issue. That's the issue. Do you want to use recovery? Do you want to do safe boot? Do you want to do this? Do you want to do that? The computer would still at least boot, but it's going to give you all kinds of errors and all kinds of solutions you can go and use to resolve this error. They are stating the computer does not boot. So reinstalling the operating system is not going to solve that. On to B says configuring a new RAID array. Now, assuming this computer actually is using a RAID array, which is extremely unlikely these days, computers on their own don't actually use RAID arrays. But assuming it is a RAID array, it, first of all, I would like to know what kind of RAID array this is. Is it RAID 0? Is it RAID 1 that this machine is using? And even if it is a RAID issue, it's the same as the operating system issue. When you start computer, it would tell you no boot device found, or this is the issue, or that's the issue. The computer would at least still boot. It would boot, but it's going to give you some sort of error, most likely. They are stating the computer does not boot. So we can rule out A, we can rule out B. C says report the status of the hard drive and close the ticket. Now that sounds very mean, and it's not going to solve the issue. That should be your last step. So if all else fails, yes, I suppose, going to report the status and close the ticket. Um, or if you've actually solved the problem, report the status and close the ticket. So hopefully you've solved the problem and now you're about to close the ticket. But if you've tried absolutely flipping everything and nothing worked, then I suppose you can also go and report the status of the hard drive and close the ticket. But that's going to be your last step. The question says, which of the following steps should you complete next? That's not going to be the next step. So it's not C. D says, consider another possible cause the issue. So originally you thought it might be a failed hard drive, and now you've come to the conclusion, you know what? It's not the hard drive. Well, then establish a new theory. Remember those six troubleshooting steps in the troubleshooting methodology? Your first step is to establish a theory. And going, going according to that troubleshooting method methodology, initially you thought it was a failed hard drive. You did some diagnostics. In other words, you tested your theory. So you did step two. Step two was to do some diagnostics and what have you. And then you come to the conclusion that, oopsie daisy, it's not a hard drive, which means you go back to step one, which is to establish a theory. So establishing a theory, if you look at answer D here, consider another possible cause the issue. Yes, establish a theory. E, on the other hand, says restore to the latest backup of the system. That's not going to solve the issue because, well, remember, you cannot boot the machine. How do you plan on restoring to the latest backup if you can't even boot the machine, guys? So the answer here is D. Anywho, moving on to question 43, you are troubleshooting a computer that is not completing POST. So if you don't remember what POST is or if you don't know what POST is, POST is power on self-test. So as soon as you start a computer, and you'll especially hear this of desktop PCs, as soon as you start a computer, after about one or two seconds or so, you'll normally hear like a short, quick beep. That means power on self-test has just taken place and that everything is in a good working order. You want to hear one short, quick beep. That's a BIOS code, means everything is working. If you don't get one short, quick beep and you get some sort of other code, one long, continuous beeps or just one long, continuous beep, lots of rapid beeps, that is a BIOS code that something is wrong with the machine. Now, now that we've got an idea what POST is, reading the question again, you are troubleshooting a computer that is not completing POST, so it does not give you the short beep that says everything is fine, and gets stuck at the manufacturer's logo screen. All internal, removable parts have been disconnected, and only the minimum parts, which is necessary to POST, were reconnected. However, the system remains the same. So in this computer, since it's not completing post, you've removed anything that can be removed, which is not essential, and you've kept the bare minimum, which is needed just to start the PC. So you obviously still have your motherboard and CPU, you've got the RAM and the hard drive, and that's pretty much it. You've removed anything extra that does not need to be plugged in, and it still gives you the same issue. So which of the following should you try next? Is it A, test the RAM, in different slots, one at a time, so that's pretty plausible. I would always say, use the path of least resistance. Is it B, remove and test the power supply? 
No, it's not B. Because if there's something wrong with the power supply, the PC would not start at all. It says the computer does start, it's just not, not complete post. But it does tell us that it gets stuck on the manufacturer's logo screen. So the computer does start. So the power supply does work. I can rule out B since the power supply does work since we can actually get to the manufacturer logo screen and all that. Is it C? Replace the motherboard. Uh, I doubt it. If there was an issue with the motherboard, the computer would not start at all and you would not see the manufacturer logo. So it's not the motherboard. Is it D? Change the CMOS battery. No. I'm not saying there's nothing wrong with the CMOS battery, but if there was an issue with the CMOS battery, the computer would just not know what the boot order is. It would then prompt you to choose a bootable device since it does not know the boot order and it would still boot like normal. It would not know what the BIOS password is, although not a problem since most of us don't have a BIOS password, and it would not remember the date and the time. So the biggest issue with a CMOS battery on a normal end-user PC is the fact that it does not know what to boot with. It just prompts you to choose a boot device and there you go. You're back to normal. It's going to work like fine. Now this PC gets stuck on the manufacturer logo screen. So it's not D, it's not C, it's not B. The answer is A, path of least resistance. We just test the RAM in different slots. It could be that one of the RAM modules is faulty. It could be that one of the slots is faulty. It's more than likely going to be a RAM module that's faulty. So take the RAM chip out, put it in a different slot. If there's more than one RAM chip and all the slots are full, I would say remove all the RAM chips, put one of them back, put it in the one slot. If it boots, you know it's the other slot or the other RAM chip. If it still doesn't boot, take that same RAM chip, put it in a different slot, try the same thing. If it still does the same thing, try the other chip, and then you do the same thing again. You just keep repeating. All right, so the answer here, guys, is A. Moving on to question 44. Wow, lots of questions, hey? You are replacing a ribbon on a printer that produces faded text and images when printing. Which of the following types of printers are you working on? Uh -huh. So ribbon is the ink that this printer uses. What printer uses a ribbon to be able to, well, print? So thermal printers, looking at answer A, uses, well, a wax kind of ink, so it's not thermal. Impact printers, which are also known as dot matrix printers, they do, in fact, use ribbon. And then C, laser uses toner. And the normal inkjet printers, they use uh, an actual cartridge that uses liquid ink. So the answer here, guys, is B, impact printer, which is also known as a dot matrix printer. Question 45. You have provided a limited number of users with company phones to control costs. One of these users has now opened a ticket because the phone no longer allows internet browsing over a cellular connection. The user acknowledges that the phone worked before the user's child streamed several movies using the device. Which of the following describes why the phone cannot connect? So we have a suspicion it's got something to do with the fact that this child used the phone, something to do with the fact that they were watching movies. So now that we've got that in the back of our minds, a child using the phone, they're watching movies, now the phone doesn't want to work, they can't browse the internet anymore using a cellular connection. What could be the issue here? So looking at answer A, the company's group policy disabled the device. No, I mean, companies don't like it when you go and watch movies and stuff like that, but group policy is not going to go and block you from being able to do that kinds of stuff. B, the child accidentally connected to the neighbor's wireless LAN. So in other words, the neighbor's Wi-Fi connection. So why would the child do that, first of all? And even if they wanted to go and do that, how would they have done that? Because normally one of these Wi-Fi connections would have a password on it. So that's not going to block it, guys. And if they did manage to somehow miraculously successfully connect to the neighbor's Wi-Fi, it would most likely still work because it's still an internet connection, most likely. So that's not supposed to block the person from watching movies or accessing the internet. So it's not A, it's not B. Answer C here says the device has a data cap. So in other words, a, limit, a data limit, a limit most likely for the month or something and has reached the limit. That sounds very plausible. So, so far that's gonna be my answer. I mean, remember, the kid had the phone, the kid was watching movies, movies use a lot of data, and now this person can still use the device, they just can't connect to the internet, you know, using a solid connection. So it is very likely that the, late, the data limit has just been reached here. Yeah? Looking at answer D, the device's plan has been unpaid. No, so this is a company-issued device. So the companies normally do pay their bills. It's personal people that don't pay their bills. So the most likely issue here would probably be C. If it's not C, I would have chosen D. So the answer here, guys, is C.
Question 46. You have a customer that brings their phone to your repair shop because it's experiencing extreme slowness and applications are crashing. You attempt to install a diagnostic application, but the installation fails. Which of the following should you do first to troubleshoot the issue? So there's more than one possible answer here. We want to know what should you do first. Answer A says, check the storage space. And that's very likely because the fact that the machine is getting slow, normally when a device, tablet, laptop, desktop, phone, whatever, if they get slow, it could be as a result of storage space. It could be a lot of things, but storage space can in fact cause that. So if you're running out of storage space, the device will get slow. And the fact that they said the program does not want to install or the diagnostic application does not want to install, that just kind of reinforces it because maybe there's no space to install the diagnostic application. So, so far, my answer is A. B, inspect the screen for damage. Now, assuming the screen was damaged, which I believe it's not since I didn't mention anything about a damaged screen here, the damaged screen cannot cause slowness. The damaged screen cannot cause the application to not install. So it's not a damaged screen. Looking at answer C, install the latest updates. Now, there is a very, very slim chance that maybe there was an update that took place or that did not take place, which is causing the device to be slow. It's very unlikely, but it's not going to cause the device to, well, fail to install the applications and things like that. So I'm going to rule out C as well. Looking at the last answer, recalibrate the digitizer. Now, by now, you guys should definitely know what a digitizer is since we've mentioned that in more than one question quite a few times in this specific video. So for a last time, the digitizer is part of the screen. It's the outermost layer which detects touch. So when you or the user touches the screen, it is what's able to detect where the user is touching the screen and, well, basically give or provide input to the device. Now, the question states the device is extremely slow. The digitizer would have no influence whatsoever on the device being slow. It would also have no influence on the program not installing. So maybe some icons might just not respond if you tap on your icon, but you can get some sort of other input device and you can still navigate the phone and all that. So it says the application cannot install. So it's not the digitizer. The only answer that remains plausible here is the initial one, which I said, A, check the storage. Storage meets all these symptoms. It would actually, in fact, cause the device to get slow because you're running out of storage and it would cause the failure of to install the application since, well, there's no space to install the application. Question 47. You have a user that is unable to connect a cell phone while in a car. However, a second cell phone can connect in the same car. Which of the following settings should the user check on the first phone? So we know it's not the car here because, you know, initially if I just said, hey, my phone doesn't want to connect to the car, it could be a phone issue, it could be an issue of the car, but as soon as you come with a second cell phone, that phone connects just fine to the car. So it's not the car, it's the first phone that's got an issue. So what should you check on that first phone? Now, I should probably ask you guys, how do you normally connect your phone to the car? So that will probably be Bluetooth, guys. The answer here is gonna be Bluetooth. I would go and check the settings, the Bluetooth settings on the first phone. Maybe the Bluetooth is turned off. Maybe that first phone has never been synced to that car. Maybe you need to go and resync it to the car. You never know. Maybe it was synced and someone deleted uh, the history and you need to go and do it all over from scratch again. Looking at the other answers here, I mean, they've got nothing to do with this question. I mean, location. How is the location of your phone going to have any influence on your car? Looking at hotspots. So why would you make a hotspot for your car? Have you ever heard of a car connecting to your phone's hotspot? I suppose it's possible, but that's not going to cause the car not to connect to your phone. Wi-Fi? No, cars are normally not on the Wi-Fi because they're moving around. It's not going to work. So Bluetooth remains the answer here, guys. Question 48. One of your remote users, so this is someone working from home or someplace else, most likely home. One of your remote users called you to report a notification indicating that there is limited or no connectivity. So we've had something similar like that in this video so far. And last time it was because the device had an IP IP address. And it was most likely because they, I don't know, something caused the device not to get an IP address. All right. So the user is reported limited or no connectivity is popping up on the machine. The user can access local file folders and other local machines. But things like web pages do not appear to function. 
which of the following is most likely the cause of the issue? Is it A, the user's domain account is locked out? I doubt it, guys, because the user says they can get a notification. They would not be able to see the notification if they were not logged in already. So it's not the user's domain account is locked out. B says the user switch has stopped working. If the user switch has stopped working, they would not be able to even access local file folders and other local machines. So the question says there, if you read the second sentence, it says the user can, however, access local file folders and other local machines. It's only things like web pages, which is giving this nonsense. So if the switch stopped working, you would not be able to access other things like other local machines. So it's not B, it's not A. Answer C says the user's IP address needs to be renewed. So that would mean they've got a PIPA. Generally, that would mean they've got a PIPA. But if you had a PIPA, you will see for the most part, you can't even access local machines. So you need an IP address to be able to access local machines as well as web pages. So if you don't have an IP address, nothing is going to be working network wise. It would give you the same notification. That much I can confirm. It's still going to say limited or no connectivity. It could be a PIPA or it could be something else. So if you saw a PIPA, in other words, you saw a 169.254 IP address, yes, it could have been that. But they mentioned that this person can still access local machines, yet they've got a limited connectivity issue. So we can rule out um, the IP address that needs to be renewed part here. The IP address has not expired since they can still access local machines. If it has expired, they would not be able to access local machines. So this we can say is only an internet related issue and not an IP address related issue. So D says the user's internet connection is down. Yes, because the person can only, well, the only issue here is the web pages. They can still access local resources. So it's not an IP address issue. The answer is D. Very, very almost thought it was answer C there for a moment, but it's definitely D. Question 49. Which of the following handles touch screen operation on a mobile device? Very straightforward, short question. And I think I've lost track as to how many times I've mentioned this in this video. And considering how many times I've mentioned it in this video, you should probably see that this is a very important topic for the exam, guys. You need to know this for the exam. So what controls touch on a touch screen? So if you look at a phone, a tablet, or these fancy laptops that's got a touch screen, what is the outermost layer? What is it called? It's called the digitizer. So the answer here, guys, is the digitizer. Make sure you remember that the digitizer is the one that handles the input touch of any touch device. Question 50. You just plugged in a user's new computer to a network port. After a few moments, the computer showed an APIPA IP address. So hopefully you guys remember what an APIPA IP address looks like. Which of the following is the most likely reason this happened? So they're not asking you what it looks like. They're asking you, what is the most likely reason you got an APIPA? So before we can discuss the reason, do you remember what an APIPA does or why you get it? So we know APIPA is 169.254. Why do we get it? Well, we normally get it when you or your device is unable to get an IP address from the DHCP. The DHCP could potentially be built into your router if it's a small office environment, or it could be built into your home router if it's a home environment. If it's a medium to a large size company, it's probably going to be an actual DHCP server. The point here is you or the device are unable to get an IP address for some strange reason. Cable is maybe plugged out, Wi-Fi is disconnected, you've got too weak of a signal, DHCP potentially ran out of IP addresses. I can give you a very long list of possible reasons that can actually cause this. The point is, as long as you remember, it's because you cannot get an IP. Looking at the possible answers, A says, the wireless LAN is disabling the card. Uh, no, the wireless LAN cannot do that. B, the network cable is not attached. It's plausible. B is very plausible. So depending on what the other answers here is, I might go for B. It really depends on what the other answer says. Now, why I'm saying that is, B says the network cable is not attached, but it says nothing about wireless. This could potentially be a laptop. And for all we know, this laptop is connected to the network just via Wi-Fi. So having a cable not plugged in is not going to have a difference. It's not going to make a difference then. So we don't know, is this a laptop? We don't know if it's connected to the Wi-Fi or not. So 
Depending on what the other possible answer says, I might go B or I might not go B. Now C says the PC is unable to contact the DHCP server. Uh -huh. So I just changed my answer from B to C now because C is set in stone. We know for a fact, if you don't, if you have an APIPA, it's because the machine cannot get an IP address from the DHCP. It's for a fact unable to contact the DHCP. Now B is one of the reasons why it might not be able to contact the DHCP. It could be because the network cable is unattached. Um, but as I said, I mean, for all I know, that machine might be connected to the Wi-Fi, which is why I'm ruling out B here. So the answer is C, definitely set in stone without even looking at answer D. D says the DHCP server is using the address in the range of 169.254. No! 169.254 is what your machine will automatically get if it's unable to contact the DHCP. DHCP does not use the range of 169.254. That's not something you would get from the DHCP. That is something you would get if you're unable to get something from the DHCP. So the answer here, guys, is C. Question 51. You are troubleshooting an issue involving lines appearing down copied pages. Uh, but printed pages sent directly to the copier rendered as intended. All right, so this is a printer slash copier. If I go onto my computer and I say, hey, go and print something, it prints perfectly fine on that exact same printer. But as soon as I go to that exact same printer and I try and copy a page, I put it into the copier and I print something, then I start getting lines. So what is different here? So it's something to do with the copier. That much we know. So it's not necessarily something else. It's something to do with the copier. Which of the following is the most likely cause of this issue? So number A says drum needs to be cleaned. Now, generally, I would have said yes. If they said, if they send a print job directly and they copy and, 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 and no matter what they do, they keep getting these lines, then yes, I would have said A. Because generally, when you start seeing lines and stuff, it's usually because of the drum. It's usually because the drum has not been cleaned properly or is no longer cleaning itself. But they are saying here that when they send print jobs to the printer directly, it does not give the lines, which means it's not the drum. B says scratched scanner glass. Now, you know what? That could be. Could very well be. Because when I send print jobs directly to the printer, it does not use the scanner glass. But when I make a copy, yes, I do use the scanner glass because it needs to scan the page to be able to, well, make a copy. So far, the answer is B. C says third party toner. No, the toner is the ink. And I use the exact same ink when I send print jobs to the printer directly. So it's not supposed to make a difference then. Answer D, overheating system fuser. No, I use the exact same fuser when I send print jobs to the printer directly, and then it doesn't do any issue. Why is it only issues when I make copies? It's the same printer, same drum, same fuser, same toner. The only difference here, here is when I go and make a copy. So the only thing here that's different in that scenario is the scanner glass. The answer here is B, guys. Question 52. Which of the following peripherals would you use to take inventory quickly and update price tags for products. Now you'll see there in brackets it says choose two. I did that on purpose because this is going to happen in the actual exam review of you guys as well. So yes, about nine out of 10 questions, you're just gonna choose one answer out of four or so and you're gonna move on of your day. But there will be some questions in the exam where they'll tell you choose two or choose three or choose all that apply. Read the question slowly and make sure you choose the right amount so that you don't miss that thing where they say choose two. Otherwise, you might very well just choose one answer. You're going to lose some mark there, guys. So read the questions properly in the exam. Rather read slower and read properly, and then you don't lose marks. Time is normally not an issue in these exams. You normally have plenty of time. You're going to read all the questions of all the possible answers twice, and you still won't run out of time in these exams. I would not worry about time in this exam. Rather take your time and read the questions properly. Okay, so reading this question again. What peripherals would you use to take inventory quickly and update price tags for products. Is it A, a flatbed scanner? No. Where in your life have you ever heard of someone using a scanner, a flatbed scanner to go and, well, take inventory and update price tags? Is it B, a KVM switch? So that's a keyboard video mouse switch. No. That is something you would normally find in a server room where they've got one keyboard, one mouse, one screen, 
but they might have four or five or six servers. So you use that switch, it's like a little dial you switch and it's gonna switch between the different servers. So you can use the same mouse, keyboard and screen on different servers without having to go and plug it out of the one server and plug it into another server. But it's got nothing to do with taking inventory, so it's not B. C says magnetic reader. Hmm, well, that's very plausible because they have these magnets and stuff, so it could very well be a magnetic reader. So, so far, one of my two answers is going to be C, until I see otherwise. D says label printer. Maybe, but it depends on what kind of label that is. So, um, it's not going to allow me to take inventory, but it might help me update the price tags depending on what kind of label printer this is. So, I'm not too sure about D yet. E says near field communication device. No, that is something you'd use to pay. So I'm not paying for the products. I want to take inventory and update price tags. So if I want to go and pay for the devices where normally at the point of sale system, you'd go and use your tap and go function or your cell phone or your smartwatch to go and pay. Yes, that would be an NFC device. So I'm not saying these devices don't get used in a store, but this is not what we use them for. F says barcode scanner. That's definitely, definitely one of them. So I'm going to go with C and F, and that actually is the answers here, guys. Question 53. You have a user that wants to print a large job on both the front and back sides of the paper. Which of the following settings would you advise the user to change in the printer settings? So this person wants to print on the front of a page and the back of a page. What setting would that be? Is it answer A? Orientation, no. Orientation is if you want to print landscape or do you want to print horizontal or this or that. That's the way you want to print, you know. It's not front and back. It's got nothing to do with that. B, duplex. Yes, that's the answer. So if you choose duplex in the printer settings, that's to print in the front and the back of a page. You're wasting less paper. Same amount of ink you're going to be using, but less pages. Collate or collate, I'm not even sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly, I don't think I am, I'm probably butchering it. That's the sequence in which you want to print. So do you want to print page 1, 2, 3, 4? Do you want to print 5, 6, 7, 8? Do you want to print in reverse? Do you want to reprint 4, 3, 2, 1? Or just 1, 1, 1, and then 2, 2, 2, and then 3, 3, 3? That's the order or the sequence in which you want to go and print these documents. And then transparency is, well, transparency, it speaks for itself. Moving on, question 54. You have a user that brings you a smartphone for repair. If a device is unable to make or receive calls or even unable to connect to Wi-Fi, all applications on the device are working unless they require connectivity. So as long as they don't require some sort of connectivity, the application works perfectly fine. But should they require some sort of connectivity, they don't work because you can't receive or make calls and you can't connect to any form of network. Which of the following is most likely causing the problem? Is it A, airplane mode? I would think so, because airplane mode turns off all connectivity on a phone, incoming and outgoing. So Bluetooth is dead, NFC is dead, um, making and receiving calls is dead, any and all communication on a phone is completely turned off. You can still turn it on, browse the phone, as long as you don't use any connectivity. So that's what airplane mode is all about. Kind of a silly setting. I would just say turn the phone off if you're going to be on a phone, on a plane. But some people actually turn, leave it on and just put airplane mode on. I'm not sure why, because the only thing you're going to be able to do on that phone then is to play offline games, not online games, since, well, all connectivity is going to be off. Disabling the hotspot is not going to make a difference there. VPN is not going to make a difference. I mean, even if you were connected to a VPN by, by mistake or something, you would at least still be able to send and receive calls. A data limit. Assuming it's a data limit, and that might be the reason why you can't open applications online, that does not explain why you cannot make or receive phone calls. Same for disabling the hotspot. None, it's unrelated. So the only answer that covers all of that is A. Question 55. You have been dispatched to resolve a malware problem on a user's workstation. The antivirus discovered several hundred potential malware items on a workstation and removed them successfully. You decide to schedule daily scans on this system and enable system restore and then create a system restore point using that system restore. Which of the following should you do next? Is it A, run the scan again to ensure all malware has been removed? That's not going to make a difference, guys, unless you plan on 
uninstalling that antivirus and installing a new, different antivirus, you cannot expect to receive a different result. This is not a human, it's a piece of software. So if it removed everything the first time successfully, you're not going to see any different result to run that exact same scan again. No difference whatsoever. B says quarantine the infected system or the, the infected workstation. Why would you want to do that? The, the question specifically says the antivirus discovered several hundred potential malware items on the workstation and, there's an and, removed them successfully. It says removed them successfully. Why do you want to quarantine this workstation if it's all been removed successfully? What? There's no point in that. So I don't disagree of quarantining the system, but that's something you should have done way in the beginning before you even started the shenanigans. Not after it's already been resolved. That's a little too late, wouldn't you say? Answer C. Install all of the latest Windows updates to patch the system. Now that sounds pretty plausible. Generally, after you fix someone's machine, it's always a good idea to go and update the antivirus Go and update the winners of the latest updates and builds and patches and whatever. Update everything on that machine just to make sure that it's still secure. And then D says, educate the user on safe browsing practices. Now, I'm not disagreeing of D. D is also correct, but C is more correct because the question says, which of the following should you do next? Next is in capital letters. So D is not wrong, but you're going to do C before you do D. So you're first going to go and update that machine, update its antivirus, get it secure and to the most recent of this and the most recent of that. And once you're completely done with that machine, your last step would be to go and educate the user. Tell them, don't do this, don't do that, that stuff. Moving on to question 56. Which of the following would you use to store memory chips from a laptop safely after an upgrade? So if you go and upgrade a laptop and let's say you take out some old RAM chips, which are smaller. Maybe I took a two gig chip out and I put in a four gig, or maybe I took a four gig out and I put an eight gig chip in there. What am I gonna do with those old RAM chips? Because they're still working. They're just, well, too small now, too small for that laptop. So where and how can you go and store these chips safely? Because there is such a thing as static, never mind the human body having static in it that can potentially blow these, these circuit chips and all that. Other things can also cause static. So we wanna protect these chips. How and where can one do that? Can I put them in cardboard boxes? No, it's a container, but it's not gonna prevent things like static. Can I put them in freezer bags? No, it's a bag, but that's about it. It needs to be an anti-static bag. So if it was a bag, which is an anti-static bag, you'll find it's those silverish gray looking ones that can basically zip lock themselves. Those ones you'll find often um, Pieces of hardware like graphics cards and RAM chips will actually come in these anti-static bags when you buy them. Those are fine. Is the answer C, anti-static containers? Yes, that sounds like an answer to me. D says just paper envelopes. So the only answer here that looks plausible is the anti-static containers. Now normally I put them in anti-static bags, but an anti-static container would probably do the same thing. I mean, as long as it's a container or some sort of storage little place, which is anti-static. I was looking for the word anti-static and I'm gonna go with answer C and that actually is the answer. Question 57. You have a user that has a laptop which is shutting down unexpectedly. Yeah, no surprise there. You notice that the shutdowns only happen when the laptop is moved from one room to another. So unless you move this laptop around, it works just fine. But as soon as you move the laptop around, it starts shutting down unexpectedly. So it's got something to do with this laptop being moved around. You reseat the hard drive, the memory, the battery, and even the LCD cable, but the laptop continues to shut down. Which of the following is the most probable cause of the issue? Is the system overheating? No, if the system was overheating, it would make no difference when you move the laptop around. They said it only happens when you're moving it around. So why would the system now suddenly overheat because of me moving it around? That should not make a difference whether I'm moving it around or not. B, loose battery connection. Uh -huh. You know what? That sounds like the answer to me. Because when you're moving it around, things jiggle around inside the laptop. And those connections in the battery, if they happen to be loose, that could very well cause an unexpected shutdown. So, so far the answer is B. Is it C, CMOS battery failure? If the CMOS battery did fail, which I doubt, um, it's not supposed to have an influence when you're moving around. Why does this only happen when the laptop's being moved around? 
So that already rules out CMOS battery. And if it did fail, CMOS battery cannot cause a, a laptop to shut down unexpectedly. So if, even if the laptop did have a faulty CMOS battery, cannot cause a laptop to shut down. The, bat the, the time and the date would just be incorrect. It might not know what device to boot from. It might not remember the BIOS password, but it would not cause it to unexpectedly shut down. D, gyroscope malfunction. That's normally something you would find in a tablet and a lap, uh, a tablet and a, and a cell phone. Gyroscope is the same thing as that auto rotate where it basically detects which side is up and which side is down when you move the phone on its side and that kind of stuff. Laptops don't generally have that. And even if it did have that, a gyroscope malfunction would not cause the device to just shut down unexpectedly. It would just not work. That's it. So the answer here, guys, is loose battery connection because as soon as you move that, that laptop around, the battery connections are probably jiggling around. They're making contact. They don't make contact, which causes the laptop to shut down. Question 58. One of your users complains that their printer has an error which states replace filament. Ah. With which of the following printers is your user most likely having problems? So the question here is, what printer uses filament in other words? Is it a thermal printer? No, thermal printers use paper and wax ink. Filament is the actual thing that they use to print with, by the way, for this printer. Inkjets use cartridges with liquid ink. Laser printers uses, well, also cartridges, but this is toner ink. And 3D printers, they use filament. It's almost like a special kind of plastic they used to go and print with. So the answer here, guys, is 3D printers. They use filament. Question 59. Wowza, we're almost at the end. And um, when we reach the end of this video, don't disappear on me. I've got a couple of things I need to mention to you guys um, regarding some more practice questions. So 59 says the touchscreen feature on a Windows device has stopped working. So this is most likely not a tablet or phone. I'm not saying it's not. I mean, you do get Windows tablets and phones, but it's most likely not a tablet or phone. It's probably a laptop. So which of the following should you check first? Is it device manager? No. Device manager is where you go and check the drivers of devices. So if it suddenly stopped working, the touchscreen functionality, you're not going to go and check device manager. Unless you just installed a new driver or uninstalled the driver, I would not go and check device manager. They say absolutely nothing about drivers here. But just say it has stopped working. So it's unlikely to be the device manager. Performance monitors to check. Well, you can go and add various counters and minutes, monitor the performance of various things on the machine. But it's not going to show you why or when the touchscreen stopped working. So performance monitors also completely out. Is it C? Digitizer settings. Yes, that's plausible because digitizer has got to do with the touch screen. It could be that there's a setting that's incorrect regarding the touch screen. And that's probably why it stopped working. I mean, heck, for all we know, it just got turned off. Is it security settings? No, this has got nothing to do with security. It's about touch. It's about input. So it's digitizer, the answer, guys. And then question 60, the last question for this specific video, guys. And um, I'm most likely going to be making a version 3 of this uh, quarter 1 questions as well. So these questions we're looking at is for quarter 1, the 1101. So this is the second video I've made for this. The, the version 1 is also on the channel, so feel free to go check version 1. It's got 50 questions. The second video has got 60 questions. Quarter 1 at the moment only has one video, at least when I released this video, it only had one video. And I plan on making a second video for Core 2 as well. So if you guys need to go and write Core 2 as well, it currently has one video, which is 50 questions. And I probably will be releasing another second video for it sometime soon with some more practice questions. So keep an eye out on the channel if you're into that or if you're looking for that. Now getting to the last question here, which of the following is the most likely cause for a PC to have an APIPA IP address? I think I probably don't even need to mention the possible answer to you guys because by now, after covering it so much in this video, you probably know what a PIPA is. A PIPA is when you're unable to get an IP for some reason. And there's only 169254. something dot something. Where do we get these IP addresses from? If you're on dynamic, from the DHCP. So looking at the possible answers here, is it A, DHCP failure? Hmm, that's plausible because if DHCP failed, you would have an APIPA IP address. So so far the answer is A. Is it B, DNS resolution? No, that's converting IPs to names and names to IPs. So if they were moaning and groaning about not being able to load websites, yes, it could have been DNS. This has got nothing to do with websites. Is it C, 
duplicate IP address. That would be seen as an IP address conflict and it would kick them off. They would actually get an error message saying you've got an IP address conflict, but it would not remove the IP necessarily. So it's not C, it's a D. Active Directory unavailable. Now this has got nothing to do with Active Directory, first of all. Active Directory does not, has nothing to do with IP by IP addresses. It's got to do with user accounts and groups and group policies and that kinds of stuff. And even if by some chance it was unavailable, people would still actually be able to log on of the last account they logged in with. So if the network is unavailable or whatever, you can still log in with your domain account because it caches the last account you've logged in with. You just might not be able to access all the resources immediately until the connection's back up, but you can at least log in of your last domain account that's still cached on the system. So the answer here, guys, is DHCP failure. All right, folks, we have finally reached the end of this video. Believe me, I'm tired. My mouth feels like a cotton ball from all this talking. So this video is probably around two and a half hours, maybe even up to three hours long. I don't know. I can't see the counter. So I'm going to estimate it's between two and a half hours and three hours. So guys, thank you very much for watching up until this point. If you have any questions regarding what was discussed in this video, feel free to post those comments down below. Alternatively, you can join my Discord server. You'll find the link in the video description. It's going to be way at the bottom of the video description. Join the Discord server, ask your questions there. I'm in that server of a lot of IT guys. Feel free to ask your questions there. And yeah, if you would like to know anything else regarding the exam, put it in the comment section down below. Thank you very much for watching this video, guys. Thank you for supporting the channel. Stay tuned. I am going to be releasing more practice questions as well as some actual training materials for some of the courses. So keep an eye out for that. And then lastly, before we disappear, a shout out to all the sponsors of this channel. If you would like to do that too, you can find the links in the video description down below, guys. So yeah, I would very much appreciate it if some of you guys can sponsor the channel. Anyway, thank you to the Patreon sponsors. Thank you to the PayPal sponsors. There's a list of all the guys that's sponsoring on PayPal. Thank you very much, guys. I appreciate you all. There's a list of the PayPal guys that's sponsoring via PayPal. And also thank you to the guys that's clicking on the thanks button below the video if it's still there. And those of you just buying me a milkshake or a coffee. All of that's in the video description down below. And then just one last time, I'm just going to mention there is a Discord server. It's called Free IT Training. It's completely free, this server. So if you know what Discord is, if you'd like to join that server, Links in the video description down below, guys. All right. Keep an eye out for the next videos, guys. Have an awesome day and good luck with your exams.